um, as part of our hearing, microphones will be set on mute for the purpose of eliminating inadvertent background noise. Members and witnesses, you will need to unmute yourself each time that uh, you wish to speak. Additionally, members will need to visibly be on screen in order to be recognized. Documents for the record can be uh, sent to Ed um, say his last name. Kaznarski, Kaz, no, Kaznarski, the staffer. Sorry, Ed, for messing up your name. At uh, at the uh, email address that we have provided to to all staff, all documents will be entered into the record at the end of the the, the hearing. We'll, um, I also wanted to mention that we do have votes that are um, being called right now, and people will have to go in and out. I will call on Tony Cardenas, the um, the vice chair of this committee, when I have to leave, but we can uh, do it in uh, segments. We're not going to uh, recess for, for votes. The chair will now recognize herself for five minutes. So again, good morning and welcome to our hearing on child safety online during the COVID-19 pandemic. Children are spending twice as much time online as compared to before the pandemic. This time is increasingly spent on digital platforms not designed with children in mind. Although we all hope, and in some cases it's already happening, the kids will be able to safely return to school. Um, we should um, not be naive, however, and believe that in-person school, schooling will mean that companies stop targeting our children online. Techniques honed by companies during the pandemic and online habits that, were, that are developed by our kids will continue long after they are back in school. Many online platforms are addictive by design, grabbing attention and of course maximizing profits. Children are especially vulnerable to addictive or manipulative techniques, uh, technologies, they are more susceptible, susce you know, susceptible uh, to coercive advertising and have trouble um, resisting attentive, uh, attention grabbing features. Um, the more time children spend online, the more likely they are to be subject to harm harmful. Um, or age inappropriate content. There are few effective barriers to um, that uh, protect our children and, te and teens as well and from harmful content and hate speech that plagues our online, uh, our online discourse right now. Nor are they shielded from the loss of privacy that has become a feature of online platforms. Platforms are uh, in uh, that uh, platforms that are intended for general use aren't required to protect the privacy of children. And many of the most popular platforms say that they do not allow children that are under the age of 13, but do really nothing in order to enforce that minimum age requirement. The, uh, the harms that children and teens are experiencing online have very real and lasting side effects offline. More screen time has been uh, associated with higher levels of anxiety, depression, sleep deprivation, obesity, and even suicide. Children need tailored protections from privacy um, infringement and manipulative market, uh, marketing practices, children's privacy must be protected by upgrading CAPA, the current law, for our, um, in, uh, for our increasingly complex and connected digital world. And I wanna thank you. And this time I want to yield to um, the author of this bill that we're going to be discussing today, Congresswoman Kathy Castro. Well, thank you, Chair Schakowsky. 
Uh, you're right. When Congress wrote the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, COPPA, back in 1998, 23 years ago, uh, the internet was in its infancy. The majority of households did not have a computer and even less had the internet. There were no internet connected cell phones or devices. And if a ch child wanted to get on the internet, they'd have to go to the family desktop, usually in a shared space and type in the web address and wait for dial up internet. So despite how antiquated this may seem to us in 2021, it was revolutionary in 1998. And at that time, Congress acted to meet the moment and they put in place safeguards to protect our children in this new online environment. But boy, have things changed since then. Um, we're at another critical moment where technological innovation and our children are at the forefront. Their every move is being tracked and monetized by their phones, tablets, apps, and more. Uh, platforms are manipulating children to stay online longer and pushing them towards extreme content, infinite scrolling, and awards or badges for repeated interactions. Big business is profiting and our children are paying the price. And as our witnesses point out, that price is the real world harmful impact on our kids' safety, their development, and their mental health. Uh, it's gotten worse during the pandemic children's screen time has gone up while parents' ability and time to monitor the screen time has gone down. So parents are looking to Congress to make sure their kids are safe and uh, that educational experiences work. So we need to meet this moment. Uh, I intend to reintro reintroduce my Kids Privacy Act and uh, the Kids Act to, to safeguard our kids. And I'd like to invite members from both sides of the aisle to work with me uh, to, to update COMPA. Thanks, and I yield back. The chair now recognizes Mr. Bill, Billy Rockus, the ranking member of the subcommittee um, for uh, his five minutes. You are recognized, Mr. Billy Rockus. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, I want to thank you for holding this very important hearing. Uh, I know we share a similar view that while technology can be amazing in keeping us all connected, when it comes to substitution for interpersonal communications, we are all at a loss. My father uh, served on this committee, and, and back when he did serve, we could talk amongst the dais, write each other notes, communicate more directly on what's happening in our lives, both personally and professionally. Unfortunately, here we are all in a virtual hearing. While we have gotten a bit better from the early days of virtual hearing, we're all human. I expect there will still be miscues uh, today, like when someone is ready to talk or providing the kind of attention our witnesses deserve for their statements, and I appreciate them being here. Now, think about what it's like for our kids. This is their new reality, and it is a sad one, in my opinion. The COVID-19 pandemic has caused so many Americans to become isolated in their homes, especially our kids. Without opportunity for children to interact in person, with their friends directly, many turn to social media to fill the void. Sadly, this has led to a cascade of negative effects for them. I believe this hearing can serve as an important alarm bell for safely reopening our schools and getting students and teachers back in the classroom and reverse this trend. To be fair, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was much unknown about the virus and virtual school was seemingly viable it's a viable bridge uh, to educating students. And it's better than not having anything. Distant learning can certainly be a positive tool for some students. But the facts now make clear that a, as a primary means of instruction, it just doesn't work for advancing our kids' education, especially those children with disabilities. Uh, there is good news, however. A number of schools have shown they can uh, safely open up including uh, in my great state of Florida. And so I hope we can find avenues for all students to have the same accessibility to educational opportunities. The alternative is catastrophic, unfortunately. 
Uh, this was on full display in Clark County, Nevada last year. In that case, more than 3,000 alerts about students with suicidal thoughts flooded the inbox of district officials. The school district since reopened to in-person schooling, but tragically too late. By December of last year, 18 students took their own lives. 18 families lost their children. We all have a Clark County where history can repeat itself. That's why I was pleased that earlier this year, President Biden pledged to reopen the schools by his 100th day in office and CDC, the CDC director Walensky relayed that data indicated schools can begin to safely reopen and more than one day a week, I'll add. Still, we are all alarmed by recent contradictory statements to the science behind these commitments. So it will be interesting to find out what changed. Hopefully the panel will have some insight there. I also want to note as privacy protections are on the agenda today that I want to be part of the real solution. Committee Republicans have been and remain committed to this. And to speak more on this topic, I'd like to yield to my good friend, Congressman Tim Wahlberg, for his efforts to reach a bipartisan deal on a bill to improve upon the child online privacy protection. I yield the rest of my time to Representative Wahlberg. Thank you. I, I thank my good friend. Uh, when I first introduced the Protect Kids Act, there was a pressing need to modernize the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act uh, to reflect the digital area. In the midst of this global pandemic, uh, with children and the parents challenged, there's an even more pressing need than ever. While the FTC made improvements to COPPA in 2013, they did not, not go far enough to protect children against new threats in the evolving digital ecosystem. The internet has drastically changed since, since 2013, and while increased internet usage presents many complicated risks, children online privacy is one area Congress established clear, uh, clear law. But the law is outdated. It needs to be updated uh, to ensure children are protected uh, from t troubling conduct of big tech. The Protect Kids Act uh, represents a common sense bipartisan solution. And I appreciate my good friend, Congressman Rush, for joining me in this effort to put children's well-being at the top of Congress's priority list. Together, we are continuing to work with stakeholders to strengthen this bill. We welcome input from members of this subcommittee and look forward to working together to pass these much needed reforms. I thank you and I yield back. The gentleman yields back and the chair now recognizes Mr. Pallone, chair of the full committee for five minutes for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairwoman Schakowsky. The, the COVID-19 pandemic is an unprecedented public health and economic crisis, which has greatly disrupted our lives. The children in particular have had their worlds turned upside down. Visits with friends and extended family have been replaced by video conferencing and in-person activities replaced with video games, social media, video services, and other digital activities. And as a result, kids' screen time has doubled during this pandemic. And you just told me that. Uh, Madam Chair on the elevator, and I didn't realize it was that much, twice. As this subcommittee has heard time and time again, consumers online face manipulative advertising, disinformation, harassment, dark pattern manipulation, and privacy intrusions. For adults, these dangers are extremely hard to manage, but for children, such practices are downright predatory. Children do not possess the same levels of cognitive development to defend themselves, and are often uniquely vulnerable to any negative effects. The online world can affect children's mental and physical health. Uh, growing bodies of research confirm the link between increased digital media use and depression and higher instances of addiction, anxiety, sleep deprivation, and obesity. And we also have seen harmful behaviors such as cyberbullying increase during the pandemic. Unfortunately, many companies are well aware that children are spending more time online and they're taking advantage of that by proactively targeting, manipulating, and monetizing our children. For example, some internet platforms, app developers, and content creators propagate addiction by design through sophisticated, thoroughly tested means to keep kids on their sites and extract money. Common elements include pressuring in-app purchases without parental consent, so-called freemium apps that tease paid versions, and gamification marketing, where gameplay elements themselves are used to promote purchases or products. 
And then there's influencer advertising, Madam Chair. People on social media with lots of followers post photos and videos of themselves using a product, but kids and sometimes even adults don't understand that those people are often paid for for those posts. And young children frequently have no idea that the video they're watching of someone opening a new toy is actually meant to sell the toy. So online advertising spending is now the largest of any medium and spending on digital ads specifically targeting children is expected to reach $1.7 billion this year. Most apps directed to or used by children contain ads, including 95% of the apps aimed at kids under five. Ads for toys or junk food are commonplace, but far too often kids are exposed to ads for tobacco products, alcohol, violent movies, or video games, or, or other age inappropriate content. And it's deeply concerning that business models online continually seek to maximize engagement to increase revenue at the expense of children's health. Many parents try to balance the benefits of internet use, such as social connections and educational apps, while trying to limit the possible negative effects. But many parents are overwhelmed and even their best efforts are not enough to protect their kids against sophisticated predatory practices. And the pandemic has made it painfully clear this problem is not gonna fix itself, nor will the harmful activities targeting our kids stop when the pandemic is behind us. Despite laws to protect children's privacy, data collection and tracking of children is disturbingly prevalent. Many apps for kids on mobile devices are notorious for collecting personal information and their personal information is then bought and sold, resulting in targeting advertising designed to influence and manipulate children even more. So Congress granted the FTC rulemaking authority under the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act or COPPA precisely so it could update the safeguards for children online as technology advanced. And the internet has experienced a sea change since the last updates to the COPPA rule. I know that Ms. Castor mentioned this with her legislation. And it's clear that those rules are out of date and no longer provide the intended protection for our kids. So while the FTC has started the process of updating its rules under COPPA, we also must examine whether the statute should be updated and whether the practices targeting children should be regulated. We can't leave it all to parents. The challenges children face online existed before the pandemic, but they've only gotten worse. And it's gonna to continue to increase after the pandemic is behind us unless we do something about it. So I just wanted to thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and also uh, uh, um, Kathy Castor because uh, of the fact that you are having this hearing, drawing attention to this with the legislation. Uh, look forward to this expert panel on what's a very important topic. Thank you. The uh, gentleman yields back, and the chair now recognizes Ms. Rogers, ranking member of the full uh, committee for uh, five minutes for her opening statement. Good, good morning, Madam Chair, and everyone, welcome. Our discussion today is especially important to me, not just as a member of Congress, but as a mom. We absolutely need to have a serious discussion about what's happening to our kids online, their mental health and safety, and what needs to happen to reopen schools immediately. Yesterday, we heard from four doctors who wrote in USA Today, quote, keeping schools closed, even partially closed, based on what we know now is harming our children. They said the Biden administration misinterpreted their research and science when creating the CDC guidance. And it ultimately led to harmful policy that hamstrung states to reopen schools quickly. The science is clear. Viral transmission is minimal in schools. Children are not a significant risk of poor outcomes from COVID-19. It's time to reopen immediately and listen to the experts who are saying loud and clear Follow the science. School closures are harming children. It's more than just a homework gap. There are serious health and mental health risks associated with children spending more time online. And as we've heard today, it's doubled. These are stories I'm hearing from parents who are pleading for schools to reopen. I hear it every day. Our kids aren't active. They're not engaged. They're falling asleep during remote school. They're isolated. Suicide and overdose risk are going up. As our children spend more time online, they're more at risk to online predators. This has all happened in my community, and I know we aren't alone. The science tells us all these risks of despair far outweigh COVID-19 in schools. In addition to the USA Today, I encourage everyone also to read a piece from the New York Times 
It documents scientific insight from health professionals. Here's what one pediatrician from San Francisco said, quote, we are witnessing a significant public health crisis in our children who are experiencing unprecedented mental illness and physical ailments during this time. This would be mitigated if not completely alleviated by in-person schooling, end quote. I understand that our focus today is on sa child safety in an increasingly digital age. For the safety of our children, surely we can all agree science, not fear, should dictate how we protect them and build a better future, a future with hope. We can mitigate a lot of the harms and risks we're talking about today by not letting another day go by of school closures. That's what's going to give our children the best chance to succeed and thrive in life. Now, specifically regarding their protection online, I am committed and convicted as to the importance of updating and modernizing our laws. I look forward to joining bipartisan work for data and privacy protections, especially children's privacy. I sincerely hope these efforts resume soon and that this committee plows the hard ground necessary to legislate in a bipartisan way again. As we look to the future of building a better world for the next generation, I wanna be clear, America can lead a new era of technological innovation. We must lead with our values for freedom, human rights, and human dignity. But we are failing with closed schools and this year long experiment of remote learning, more screen time and more isolation is failing our kids. Our kids are in crisis. Technology should add to education. It's not a substitute for everyday learning. It's not a substitute period. Reopening for in-person learning doesn't mean two days a week. It means five days, both for the teacher and the children in the classroom together. Before the president's address tonight, we should all be asking why more is not being done to reopen. Just as the doctors wrote in USA Today, this is a human rights issue. Let's open the doors of our schools and let our kids learn and thrive again. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to include both art articles I mentioned in the record. Uh, all, all of those uh, will be added at the end of the, uh, the, the hearing and I thank the gentlelady and she yields back. I, I yield back. To... Sorry, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I ask. Yes. Thank you. Um, and um, the, the chair would like to remind members that pursuant to committee rules, all members written opening statements shall be made part of the record. And now I will introduce the uh, witnesses that we have and thank them so much for their participation today. Um, okay, Do uh, Dr. Um, Nushin, uh, Amid, uh, Amidadine, did I get that? Let's see, um, Amidadine, um, Chair of the Council on uh, Communications and Media at the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, we have Corey A. Um, DeAngelis, De um, PhD, Director of School Choice at um, at the Reason Foundation, um, adjunct adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute, and executive director of the Educational Foundation Institute, and Ariel Fox Johnson, who is the senior counsel of global policy at uh, Common Sense Media. And we want to thank all of you for joining us for this very important hearing today, which I am getting the feeling has a good deal of bipartisan support, and we look forward to your testimony. So uh, Dr. Uh, Minadim, um, you are recognized for five minutes. Okay, 
Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair Schakowsky, Ranking Member Billy Rackus, Chair Pallone, and Ranking Member Rogers, along with members of the subcommittee. Thank you so much for inviting me to discuss young people's digital media use during the pandemic. I'm Dr. Nushina Minadine, and I'm a pediatrician at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. I'm here today representing the American Academy of Pediatrics, a nonprofit professional medical organization of more than 67,000 pediatricians, where I serve as chair of the Council on Communications and Media. Today's youth are growing up immersed in digital media. In 1970, kids began watching TV around four years of age, but today babies start interacting with digital media within the first few months of their lives. Media's impact on children has been an issue for years, well before a global pandemic forced us all to move our lives online. The pandemic has laid bare this long-standing issue, creating an opportunity to address structural issues within the digital ecosystem. As a pediatrician who's been caring for patients this entire pandemic, I have to acknowledge the unprecedented challenges that families are up against. It's no surprise that screen time has increased significantly under these circumstances. As pediatricians, we also have to acknowledge the reality of the ubiquity of digital devices. We don't simply pre preach device abstinence. We encourage moderate, balanced, pro-social use of devices as part of a media diet. Technology can have important benefits for children and teens, like broadening horizons and as a learning tool. The internet provides space for community building among youth who are marginalized, including children with serious diseases. Children of color who face racism can build resilience by sharing those experiences and finding support online. With these benefits in mind, we also need to focus on the real threats posed by technology. The bottom line is that parents need help and technology companies must be held accountable for the products that they create. Data collection and compromised privacy are among the most pervasive threats facing young people. Companies can contact, track, and influence users through digital trails that they leave behind. Users can unknowingly disclose location, activities, likes, and dislikes along with in-app behavior. This can this unintentionally or sorry, this intentionally opaque process is then used to make ads more effective and platforms more successful and profitable. Children using these products don't fully understand the ramifications of this data collection, which can also influence the, in, the information that reaches them. Ad content is tailored to their interests and creates false norms that undermine healthy behaviors. Algorithms can accurately predict what a child will want to watch next. These elements make it so hard for young brains to resist. Many products feature manipulative design that nudges users into specific behaviors. An example is the autoplay feature on platforms like Netflix and YouTube, which places the onus entirely on young people to opt out of watching the next video, making increased screen time an almost foregone conclusion. But that's not all. Gamified ads and in-app purchases that reward users for watching ads and buying products are very appealing to children. During the pandemic, users of a supposedly free math game were shown 16 different ads and only four math problems over 19 minutes of gameplay. Social media allows companies to reach young people with paid influencer marketing through platforms like YouTube and TikTok. Young people are led to believe that posts reflect the genuine preferences of the poster, when in fact they're actually being targeted by marketing campaigns. Algorithms also drive young people to inaccurate, inappropriate, and even harmful content like misinformation about COVID-19 and vaccines, another issue that pediatricians experience firsthand and have for a while. Youth of color face challenges accessing positive aspects of technology due to a long-standing digital divide, which includes disproportionate targeting for unhealthy ads that worsen health disparities and increased screen time stemming from structural issues. In order to make real progress for children and families, we must preserve the positive aspects of technology while removing the pervasive threats it can pose. The AAP recommends that Congress strengthen the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, and enhanced COPA should protect all children under the age of 18 and cover the wide array of devices that collect data from children. If data collection is even allowed for young people, it should be an opt-in. Congress must also ban targeted advertising to, to those under age 18. And finally, Congress should fund efforts to improve digital literacy, address digital equity, and expand research on how digital media impacts children. The issues that young people and their families face in the digital world are not insurmountable. Through effective public policy, it is possible to build a better digital world for our children during and after this pandemic. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, now I will recognize Dr. DeAngelis. Um, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Chair Schakowsky, Ranking Member Bill Rockus, and distinguished members of Congress, thank you so much for the opportunity. There have been substantial costs associated with keeping schools closed in terms of students losing ground academically, mentally, and physically, and many of these negative effects have disproportionately impacted less advantaged groups, leading to inequities. Meanwhile, the evidence has generally indicated that schools can reopen safely for in-person instruction and that school reopenings are generally not associated with major increases in overall COVID-19 transmission or hospitalizations. In addition to the science, actions by several teachers unions and the stark contrast in the response to the pandemic from the private versus the public sectors suggest that reopening decisions have had more to do with political partisanship and power dynamics than safety and the needs of families. Private schools have been open for the most part of the past year or have been fighting to reopen in that time. In fact, private schools in Kentucky took the fight to the Supreme Court in an attempt to provide in-person services and private schools in states such as Ohio and Michigan took similar legal actions. A private school in Sacramento even rebranded itself as a daycare to try to get around the government's arbitrary school closure rules. But many teachers unions have been fighting to remain closed by shifting the reopening goalposts every step of the way. It's not because of a difference in, in intentions or benevolence on the part of the employees between the two sectors. The difference is one of incentives. One of these sectors gets children's education dollars regardless of whether they open their doors for business. Several actions by teachers unions also raised some eyebrows. Just as school closures hit in March 2020, union groups in states such as Oregon and Pennsylvania lobbied the government to make it illegal for families to switch to virtual charter schools that have already been successfully providing students with remote instruction for years. These actions aim to protect a system at the expense of families at the worst time possible. Then came the political demands. In their report on safely reopening schools, the Los Angeles Teachers Union called for things unrelated to school reopening, such as defunding the police, Medicare for all, a wealth tax, and a ban on charter schools. At least 10 teachers unions similarly joined with the Democratic Socialists of America to hold a national day of resistance to demand safe schools, including political demands on two occasions in less than a year. Other things just didn't add up. Why was it safe? For enough for public school buildings to reopen for in-person child care services, but not for in-person learning? Why was it safe enough for teachers union officials to travel to Puerto Rico to vacation in person and to send their own children to in-person private schools, but not safe enough for their members to return to work in person? Why have four studies each found that school reopenings are more strongly related to political partisanship and teachers union influence than COVID risk? Why did the Congressional Budget Office estimate that only 5% of the $128 billion in relief funding would be spent this year, while up to 95% of the funding would be paid out after the pandemic if the goal is to reopen schools now? Why did half of the Senate block an amendment that would have made it federal relief funding conditional upon uh, reopening schools in person if all teachers were vaccinated? Why has Florida, a state that only spends about $10,700 per student, far below the national average, been able to essentially fully reopen its schools while California, a state that has much stronger teachers unions and spends about 38% more per student, has kept its stores shut. It might be because the school reopening debate has always been more about politics and power than safety and the needs of families. The past year has put a spotlight on the main problem with K-12 education in the U.S., a long existing massive power imbalance between public school teachers unions and individual families. And the only way that we're ever going to fix that messed up set of incentives that's baked into the public school system is to empower families by funding students directly. Think about it this way. If a grocery store doesn't reopen, families can take their money elsewhere. If a school doesn't reopen, families should similarly be able to take their children's education dollars elsewhere. After all, education funding is supposed to be meant for educating children, not for protecting a particular institution. Families have been getting a bad deal and they're realizing that there isn't any good reason to fund closed institutions when we can fund students directly instead. The latest nationwide survey conducted by Real Clear Opinion Research found that support for funding students directly surged by 10 percentage points between April and August of 2020. And we already fund students directly in higher education with Pell Grants and the GI Bill and in pre-K with programs such as Head Start. The funding goes to individual students and families as opposed to buildings. With all of these programs, in addition to food stamps, Section 8 housing vouchers, and Medicaid, we fund individuals instead of institutions. We should apply the same logic to K-12 education and fund students, not systems. Thank you so much. Johnson, you are recognized for five minutes. 
Thank you. Okay. Good. Go ahead. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Pallone, Chair Schakowsky, Ranking Member McMorris Rogers, Ranking Member Bill Rockus, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the invitation to appear before you and for recognizing that the digital world, for all of its opportunities, poses unique risks and harms to children and teens. The pandemic has certainly exacerbated these risks and harms, but they existed before. And unless Congress acts, they will persist after. I'm Ariel Fox Johnson, Senior Counsel for Global Policy at Common Sense Media. Common Sense is the leading organization dedicated to helping kids and families thrive in a rapidly changing digital world. My testimony emphasizes three main points. First, children and teens are on the front lines of our online world, and they're uniquely vulnerable to digital harms. Second, the status quo is failing young people. And third, Solutions to these challenges are the responsibility of Congress and tech leaders themselves. We need a healthy internet, especially now. In my house, with limited to no childcare, our screen time rules have gone out the window. Just this weekend, I told my children to go watch a movie or play on their tablet so that I could prepare this testimony. While it was once debatable whether kids could choose to be online, it's now clear that there's no choice. It's necessary to connect with family, to learn and to play. Our research shows that device ownership was already the norm for young children and that screen time had multiplied in recent years with children in lower income houses spending nearly two hours more daily with screens. The pandemic has turbocharged this. Distance learning is a big driver for older kids, yes, but screen time is up for all kids. As of this fall, children ages two to 15 watch television, including streaming, a full day each week. YouTube and gaming consoles have seen spikes in usage, some with 82% more daily users. Social media and mobile use is up. And one study found that kids were sending and receiving three times more messages than the year before. Parents are worried. Parents' top child health concerns in 2020 were overuse of social media, bullying and cyberbullying, and internet safety. Young people are impulsive and they're prone to overshare. They don't understand that data shared on an app doesn't remain on their device, let alone grasp complex online data and advertising ecosystems. They're more susceptible to ads and other forms of online persuasion. Kids are no match for tech companies who've grown unchecked and remain unaccountable. Too many are manipulating children, misusing their personal information, and exposing kids to harm. And this isn't something that will magically stop when the pandemic ends. Kids are surveilled everywhere. We talk about a digital footprint, but at this point, it's more accurately a full body scan. Manipulative design pressures teens to click and scroll constantly and to tie their self-worth to numbers of likes. Elementary students can drain their parents' credit cards with in-app purchases and get shamed by beloved characters to spend more money. More than nine in 10 teens report seeing violent content online. Our own forthcoming research details how the number of teens who've seen racist content online has nearly doubled in the past two years. Meanwhile, kids' mental health is taking a hit. So what should Congress do? Madam Chair, you and others in this committee have been leaders here. And as we've seen from the statements from the committee and the witnesses today, there's clear agreement that there is a problem. The challenge is ensuring that when Congress does act, it makes a real difference. There's a risk that Congress may act, but not do enough. We believe, as do many of you, that COPPA is outdated. It must be updated meaningfully. Congress should pass a strong comprehensive privacy law with special protections for vulnerable children and teens. The Privacy Act introduced by Representative Castor, along with Representative Dingell and other members, would address many of COPPA's shortcomings, would force sites to acknowledge kids, protect and empower teens, and prohibit behavioral marketing to kids. Congress should also pass Representative Castor, Clark, and Wexton's Kids Act, which would create rules around online marketing to kids and encourage kid-healthy content and design, banning autoplay and amplification of harmful content. We support other steps to hold tech accountable as well, but we believe that there's much that industry can do right now. They don't need to wait for Congress to minimize information collection and design healthier products for kids. 
and their reluctance to act is inexcusable. Technology and media offer enormous benefits, but kids deserve better online. They needed it before and they'll need it after the pandemic. Thank you and I look forward to questions. Thank you. Thank you. And the uh, gentlelady yields back. Um, we have concluded witnesses opening statements at this time. Um, and so we are going to move to member questions. Each member will have five minutes to uh, ask questions of our witnesses. And I will start by, um, with, uh, by recognizing myself for, for five minutes. Um, so the, the line between uh, people's online and offline lives has rapidly disappeared. Um, this is um, particularly true for kids. Um, and as one of our witnesses said, even infants, I've seen babies just holding devices um, in, in, in the airport and other, and other places. The ability to track um, to track children for behavioral ad for um, beha behavioral um, advert advertising coupled with um, uh, persuasion device de design tactics um, has been a has been a real um, problem and a and a threat to our our kids. Um, and I I wanted to ask Dr. Abinadim. Um, can, can you speak to how children and even teens also um, struggle to identify and resist these manipulate, manipulative techniques um, in today's complex online ecosystem? Uh, certainly. Thank you, uh, Chair Schakowsky. Uh, I think your question really gets to the heart of the problem. The fact is that children at different developmental ages have different levels of ability to understand and to resist persuasive programming. For young children, I don't think that exists, period. They just don't have the sophistication and are uniquely vulnerable to persuasive design. Even when you look at older kids, teenagers who may even have some training in digital literacy, media literacy, have a lot of difficulty resisting these very, very persuasive, well-targeted ads. Um, frankly, it's hard for adults to resist too. Um, and so that's why the American Academy of Pediatrics feels that it's so important to create structural uh, layers that hold tech responsible. And we think this is a wonderful opportunity for Congress to help pass laws that protect kids from that kind of predatory targeting and data collection. Thank you so much. Let me ask Ms. Fox Johnson, um, given that the that these marketing and design techniques is, uh, are so sophisticated, um, thorough testing and um, uh, intention, intentionally directed at, at children and teens, do you believe that the Federal Trade Commission, FTC, should regulate such practice predatory behavior under the unfair and deceptive practices author authority? I certainly believe that the Federal Trade Commission could regulate these things as unfair and deceptive, particularly to children under 13 who may not even know they're interacting uh, with an advertisement in lots of scenarios. I think that a less litigious and perhaps quicker path forward would be Congress making it clear that these practices are not allowed. Um, and, uh, and and let me let me uh, ask you um, uh, this um, about the uh, uh, the platform's uh, accountability, um, uh, Doctor uh, uh, Aminadem. Um, do you think that um, child, that uh, we we need to have platforms accountability for exposing children to harmful and inappropriate content? Um, I, I always think that accountability is important, especially when you're creating products that are not necessarily developmentally appropriate, but are still exposing children to sometimes highly inappropriate content. Um, I, we absolutely believe at the American Academy of Pediatrics that tech companies need to take responsibility for that, um, because we all believe that we have a same general goal of wanting to protect children. Thank you, and I wondered if you wanted to comment on that, Ms. Fox Johnson, the accountability of the platforms. 
Yes, these platforms are incredibly powerful and have an incredible amount of resources at their disposal. Unlike many parents, um, they are not just making content available to kids that's inappropriate, but in many cases, actively pushing it on them and, and taking them into more outrageous or um, concerning scenarios. So they could do a better job at what they pushed and also better a job at identifying healthy, positive educational content. And Dr. Uh uh, thank you, Dr. Amina. Oh, I did it again. Um, Amina Deem, um, I want to um, ask you um, how might this repeated regular exposure to inappropriate content, um, often viewed together with um, appropriate content, harm or affect our, our children? And if you could tell us long-term as well how it could affect our children. So that's a very important question. Thank you so much for, for addressing that. Repeated exposure to harmful content, whether it's violent content or, um, or frankly, you know, racist content that kids are, are encountering online really can be harmful. Um, we know from past uh, research that bias-based harassment and being exposed to these negative uh, images can really undermine a child's self-esteem. It can, it can cause significant mental distress for them. And being exposed to that repeatedly, unfortunately, only multiplies that effect which is all the more reason to be careful um, and hold tech companies accountable for, for what they're putting out there. Thank you so much. I realized I've uh, gone over my time and, uh, and I yield back. And now I um, uh, would welcome uh, Congressman Bill Arrakis to ask his questions for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it very much. Uh, Dr. Aminadin, uh, thank you, not just for your testimony, but your important work. Uh, on kids' mental health. That's so very important. They are our future. I believe your co contributions here today really serve multiple areas we're working on. So again, I really appreciate all the witnesses. I'm concerned about uh, children being, uh, again, depressed, anxious, and even suicidal. This generation has become, uh, can you, and, and uh, you know, you see it uh, on a regular basis uh, when you're, we're in our district. Can you speak to the isolation that kids have felt since the pandemic began? And can you provide perspective on what are the most common issues you, you are seeing that might be uh, driving the sadness of these kids? And then as a follow-up, would you agree that one of the best ways that we deal with these issues is to curb access to these negative impacts? Uh, thank you, uh, Ranking Member Billy Rockus. Um, such a critical question. Um, there's no doubt that pediatricians have anecdotally been reporting increased uh, increased visits for depression and anxiety. I find that those are two of the most common um, mental health issues that that I've personally been seeing during the pandemic. Um, I do want to make it clear we have been seeing increasing levels of this even before the pandemic hit, but certainly exas exacerbated by um, um, by a combination of factors. The pandemic has been very stressful for everyone. Um, I've had children whose parents have lost jobs. I've had patients who have lost family members to the to the COVID-19 disease. Um, and so really, I think it's multifactorial. Isolation certainly plays into it. And that's where, in some ways, we also have to look at the positive benefits of technology, where that has allowed them to stay connected to, to grandparents, to elderly neighbors, to friends. Um, but obviously, you know, we, we want to maximize the positive benefits without uh, leaving them vulnerable to the negative benefits. And I apologize, you had a follow-up question. Um, yeah, let me let me address it again. Would you agree that one of the best ways that we deal with these issues is to curb access to these negative impacts? So I, I would agree that the best way to help curb negative impacts is to look at the structural system and to try to minimize those harms um, through accountability for tech platforms and also legislation uh, to help regulate what children are able to access and what data is collected on them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, again, uh, doctor, for you again, there have been uh, many data and scientifically backed uh, uh, pediatricians, including those at the American Academy of Pediatricians, who argue that schools are safe enough to open. Do you agree 
with uh, your colleagues that we need to begin opening schools back up for students and teachers? So I appreciate that question. I know that that is um, a related issue, even if it's not the specific issue of this particular hearing. Um, I, I think that the American Academy of Pediatrics has put together a very thoughtful um, and evidence-based recommendation for school reopening. We also know that not all schools are equally resourced. And um, in order to make sure that schools are safe to return, we need to be able to ensure universal masking, hand washing, social distancing. Um, ideally, it would be great to have teachers vaccinated as well. That's an additional layer of protection. It's never just one thing when we talk about public health um, or health benefits, but uh, we certainly all can agree that we want to move towards the goal of making it safe for all kids to, to, re to return to school and to make sure that schools are appropriately funded so that they can ensure those safety measures for everybody. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. DeAngelis. Would you like to comment on any of the data from uh, public health masters supporting the reopening of schools. We appreciate that. Thank yeah, you. in fact, there was a, a systematic review of the evidence uh, published just today. So if you want to add it to the record, you can find it at 74 million. A reporter named Linda Jacobson actually uh, summarized the study and said, and I quote, mounting evidence shows it's safe for reopening schools and that the risk of in-person learning contributing to the spread of COVID-19 is low, according to a new review of research released Thursday. That covered 130 different studies, so it's a huge uh, amount of evidence. And then also researchers at the CDC published in a top journal, JAMA, saying that, quote, the preponderance of available evidence from the fall school semester has been reassuring insofar as the type of rapid spread that was frequently observed in congregate living facilities or high-density work sites has not been reporting in education settings in schools. And then, quote, there has been little evidence that schools have contributed meaningfully to increased community transmission. You can also look at places like uh, New York City, where the school positivity rate is less than a tenth of what the positivity rate in the overall community. You can look at quotes from people like uh, Anthony Fauci as well, saying to close the bars and open the schools, and that uh, schools are generally not major contributors of community transmission. I, I know I'm over time, but there's tons of evidence suggesting that schools can reopen safely, particularly if you uh, have the uh, 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 procedures in, in, in place. And then my latest study at Social Science Research Network suggests there's no relationship between funding and schools yeah, and reopening. We're going to have to call on the next uh, speaker. Um, I'm looking for um, Frank Malone. There, there he is. The chair of the full committee is recognized for questions for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I wanted to start out um, with Dr. Ami, Amida Dean. Um, my concern is that, uh, you know, you have many of our constituents who work two jobs and have to take care of their family and, you know, just putting food on the table is a challenge. And there was a recent common sense media survey that shows that children from lower income households spend nearly two additional hours on screens than those from higher income households. Um, you know, so while parents can supervise, uh, or at least that's the goal, it's, it's really impractical or not possible for many if they're working two jobs and have all these other things. So Dr. Amita Jean, uh, are children able to self-monitor their own digital consumption and do they know when to disconnect? I know par parental controls are viewed as an alternative when direct supervision is not possible, but 71% of parents say they are not satisfied with the tools they have used to keep kids safe. That's my question, to what extent uh, they have the ability, the kids can self-monitor, know when to disconnect or what to do, if you would. Uh, thank you, Chair Pallone. Um, so again, I think that's a critical question, whether or not children can self-monitor. And when we look at the circumstances that this pandemic has has really uh, brought to the fore, these aren't new. Um, for a long time, for decades, the American Academy of Pediatrics has recognized the unique vulnerability of young children in particular, but even teenagers, to be able to really self-monitor and resist um, resist manipulative design. And, you know, 20, 30 years ago, uh, as as I think um, one, of, one of your members uh, mentioned, it was easy to sort of turn off the TV and for parents to monitor. But these days with the ubiquity of digital devices and the ability to take these devices into bedrooms, um, it really makes it so much harder for kids to 
to self-regulate and self-monitor. Young children are not capable. I want to make that very clear. It's just not going to happen um, without some structural supports um, and parental supervision, um, which of course has become even more difficult when you've got a parent in one room working one job, a parent in another room working one job. Um, so really, again, we have to look at this as a structural issue as the American Academy of Pediatrics has done for years to recognize that we, we need more protections for our kids. Even media savvy teens have difficult self-regulating, although it's okay to give them a little bit of, uh, of, of uh, flexibility to, to try to do that. All right, thank you. Then let me ask uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Fox Johnson, can you discuss briefly the different parental control options that are currently available, including how easy they are to use, how much they cost, what that means for low-income families, and any uh, privacy concerns? And then a second question, given the limitations that you're probably going to say about these devices, how do you explain why uh, baseline default protections for children are important, if you could. Sure, thank you, Chairman Pullen. So there are a variety of parental controls and just researching all of them, it takes a lot of time, time that parents don't have. You can have uh, browser level controls, you can have uh, controls at the device level, some apps and gaming systems offer controls within them. Um, like I said, it takes time to research these and it takes additional time and effort to try to implement them in effective ways. They also, especially the better ones that do more than just allow you to block sites, but allow you to say filter content or see what your kids are doing, cost money, $10 a month, $100 a year, more money if you have more kids. Uh, this plus the time involved make it very difficult for lower income families in particular or families with less digital literacy. To, to use these tools effectively. And there's also, as you mentioned, concerns about kids growing up with surveillance and feeling normalized, and it's normal that someone can constantly follow them. Traditionally, a kid could go into a bedroom, shut their door, and have a moment of privacy. But that might not be possible if their parent or someone else is constantly monitoring them. Um, the UK has advised that with parental controls, companies should make that clear to kids so that they, they know what's going on and it's not sort of uh, secret surveillance. Uh, given what all of the baseline this, default protections, is that important? Did you? Yes. Mention? Go ahead. Baseline protections are super important because we know that defaults are super important. Lots of people don't take the time to change defaults, and companies make it very difficult to change defaults. If companies had to put kids' best interests at the front from designing their products from the get-go, it would be less critical for parents to go to the trouble and time and money of putting in extra parental controls. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back, uh, uh, Ms. Schakowsky. Thank you. And I recognize uh, Ms. Rogers, the ranking member on the full committee for her five minutes. Hi, let's see here. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this hearing today. I think it is uh, very important. I appreciate all the witnesses being here and sharing your insights with us. You know, during my opening statement, I highlighted the importance for schools to reopen fully for five days a week for students and teachers both to return to the classroom. Dr. DeAngelis, you raised some startling statistics in your testimony, especially regarding the disproportionate impact on less advantaged children in our country, like those with disabilities. Your testimony states that in 2020, failing grades in Arlington Public Schools increased 91% since the previous year for middle school students with disabilities and 81% for high school students with disabilities. Can you explain what this means for these families and these students and what it would mean for them to have school in person again? Well, thank you so much for the question. It, it can lead it to a ton of uh, long-term negative impacts uh, in addition to the student achievement negative impacts that we're seeing. And I want to say there's a nationwide analysis done by McKinsey and Company on two different occasions, finding that students have already lost months and months of learning. And Eric Kanyashek, an economist affiliated with Stanford University, did a report uh, published by the OECD find, estimating that this could have a net present value of a negative impact of around $17 trillion in the U.S. alone associated with re reductions in lifetime earnings and other uh, negative impacts to GDP. Uh, but then there's other problems that aren't associated with learning losses, like uh, mental health problems increasing. I know, uh, I think Bill, uh, Chair, 
uh, ranking member Bill Rockus had pointed out that suicides had doubled in uh, for students in Clark County Public Schools, Nevada, since the same time last year. So there's a ton of costs associated with keeping the schools closed. One more uh, district in my area, Fairfax County Public Schools, their failure rate increased by 83% relative to last year for students failing two or more classes. And that number was even larger, 111%. Uh, over a doubling in failure for two or more classes for students with special needs. So obviously, reopening the schools would lead to uh, more options for individual families to make that choice of whether uh, they want to do in-person or remote learning going forward and to be able to pick the best learning environment for their individual children, which should lead to better incomes later in life and could lead to lower likelihoods of criminal activity and better uh, uh, lifetime earnings in the long run. So these are uh important things that we need to consider there are a lot of costs to keeping schools closed and at first a lot of people were only looking at the costs associated with reopening schools we got to look at both sides of the equation thank you and as a follow-up uh, the republican leader on the subcommittee gus bill rock has mentioned that some of the schools are beginning to open washington state where i come from is is still largely locked down um some schools a small percentage have opened, um, but I wanted to ask you about the private and parochial schools because some of them have opened, more of them have opened, and I wanted to ask if you had any data on the trends of transmission rates in, in private and parochial schools. Yeah, first, I think it's common, common knowledge at this point that private schools have been substantially more likely to reopen than uh, traditional public schools in the U.S. If you look nationwide or in particular counties uh, across the country as well. And uh, there are data on uh, COVID case rates in private schools collected by Brown University. I think Dr. Emily Oster, an economist over at Brown University, has been compiling this for months, finding that one, the case rates in the schools are substantially lower than the case rates in the community over time. But then also you can break it down by public versus private schools and how many, many people are in the school. So even with the private schools with a majority and a vast majority of uh, children returning to in-person learning, the COVID case positivity rates in those schools have been substantially lower than in the overall community, sometimes as much as a, a tenth or a twentieth below the overall community positivity rate, uh, hovering around 0.5% or less pretty consistently over time. So the private schools have been able to do it. Um, and some public schools have done a good job at being able to reopen in person as well. Uh, so it, it can be done. And you can see that with the comparison that I pointed out earlier between California and Florida. Florida spends a lot less, yet they're way more likely to be open than, than California as far as their schools are concerned. And Florida tends to have a lot uh, less powerful teachers unions uh, as well. You, you mentioned in your testimony that after private and parochial schools open, nearby public schools often follow suit. It seems to me that these schools were safe enough to reopen from the beginning. Even the director of CDC believes schools could reopen. So that, why do you think this is happening? That could be another reason why Florida is more likely to reopen. They have a lot of school choice and competition through even open enrollment with their public schools and then private school choice programs. It's leading the way on those fronts, which could lead to more competition as that Brown University study found where places with more low cost private schools, the public schools were more likely to reopen as well. So I think this has a lot to do with incentives. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Um, I am going to go vote before I do that. Um, I want to um, yield to now for five minutes um, to Bobby Rush, um, my colleague from, from Illinois, for five minutes of questioning and um, thank uh, Tony Cardenas, the um, Vice Chair of this committee for taking over while I am gone. So thank you to both of you. And you are recognized, Bobby. I want to thank you, Madam Chair. And then I want to thank all the witnesses for this superb hearing. Uh, <clears throat> Ms. Fox Johnson, uh, in your testimony, you discuss how children in lower income households and those from racial and ethnic, ethnic minority groups we're spending more time in front of a screen. My question to you is, um, given the very positive and uh, inspirational uh, reports from the Biden administration uh, in that uh, this, uh, uh, the uh, vaccinations will be available to all 
Americans uh, money in um, Maine, and then certainly uh, kind of give, makes us more optimistic about schools being able to reopen no later than the fall. Uh, but in the uh, in in the in the interim, um, how do we use online uh, opportunities to uh, help uh, abrogate or help address this condition that a lot of our students have fallen so far behind because of the closure of schools? Is there any way? that we can pivot from what the current situation has been to what the current situation could possibly be given the fact that uh, we'll be uh, opening soon. Sure, and thank you, Representative Rush. I mean, the, the numbers about more students of color and more, stu more kids of color and more kids from lower income families spending more time on devices come from before the pandemic and um, children in lower income households are more likely to also uh, use apps that have ad tracking and other um, sort of COPPA violating information collection practices. I think that as everyone seems to be saying here, it will be great when schools reopen. Screen time was a problem before the pandemic, it will be a problem after. I think we need to create a healthy environment for kids online, I think Congress can help with this, companies can help with this. They can move away from business models that prioritize engagement and sensationalist content, and they can move away from behavioral ad targeting that preys on kids' particular vulnerabilities. They can try to promote high quality and educational content. I mean, Sesame Street is a, is a media product. That's a, a good product for kids. So the internet companies can change their business models and work to push high quality content that respects kids and empowers them to low, grow and learn. And uh, I mean, and then in your testimony, you stated that youth of color encounter additional challenges from digital media and face barriers accessing the beneficial aspects of technology. And this is something that has become even more evident over the past year and something that I have witnessed uh, here in my own district in Chicago. Can you please talk about the challenging uh, youth of color, challenges rather, the youth of color face and what, if anything, can Congress do to help alleviate these obstacles? Um, yes, thank you so much, Representative Rush, for that question. Um, digital inequity and the digital divide has been a concern of ours for a very long time. Those of us who are pediatricians who are interested in this issue um, and, and really are seeing why it's become such a problem. Part of the reason why youth of color are so vulnerable to this is that there are targeted advertising towards them for unhealthy products. And, you know, as we're still learning during the pandemic, and I, I anticipate a whole slew of research that will come out um, as a result of this, I can also look historically back at how in lower income neighborhoods or um, neighborhoods with large minority populations, um, alcohol and tobacco billboards um, were often uh, much more prevalent there. Like a child walking to school in a neighborhood would pass several of these billboards. And again, that's historical, but we've also seen that in terms of digital marketing, whether it's for unhealthy foods or for tobacco, alcohol, or even marijuana advertising, um, all of which uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics opposes being targeted uh, towards children, um, which I, I, I'm happy to recommend uh, our previous policy statements on that. Um, in addition to that, we have to look at the built environment around children and what's safe. If it's not safe to play outside, if there aren't green spaces, children are by, you know, by circumstance going to spend more time indoors on a screen. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. yields back. The chair now recognizes uh, member uh, Bob Lada for five minutes. I thank my friend uh, for recognizing me and uh, also for the, uh, the chair for holding today's hearing to examine how to protect children in the digital age. An issue has become amplified by the COVID-19 pandemic. In my home state of Ohio, the Department of Education is reporting significant 
areas of learning lag. Its reporting shows a decrease in third grade proficiency was clear among students learning in districts that used a fully remote education model as their primary education delivery model in the fall of 2020. In fully remote districts, third grade proficiency rates decreased by approximately 12 percentage points compared to a decrease of approximately eight percentage points in districts primary using a five-day in-person model and nine percentage points in districts prim primarily using a hybrid model. Students are cl clearly suffering across our country without in-person learning. Where schools were open, children are proving to be very resilient. However, uh, they are much less resilient to the impacts of remote or distance learning. And uh, Dr. DeAngelis, uh, thank you for your testimony and the wealth of data explaining schools are safe to reopen. As you already know, many children are struggling with distance learning and for a variety of reasons, including lack of social engagement, difficulty uh, concentrating, and Zoom fatigue. My colleagues in the majority recently uh, provided over $7 billion to fund remote learning, which means more reliance on the small screen. Now, if we're serious about connecting those without adequate broadband, we should have devoted that money toward permanent broadband infrastructure and reform our permitting laws to, to deliver connectivity to these unserved Americans. Even before COVID, we knew students without connectivity do not have the same chances for success and can be left behind. Dr. DeAngelis, have you seen distinctions on how broadband can be an important bridge for learning? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much for the question. And one thing I might add is that additional funding for remote learning could disincentivize schools from reopening for in-person instruction if they get more funding with uh, remote services. But uh, one way to access more broadband ac broadband with within communities is to reallocate the funding from institutions to individual students. There are at least 28 state legislators that have introduced uh, legislation to fund students as opposed to systems in the form, mostly uh, in the form of something called an education savings or education scholarship account, which would take a portion of the money that would have went to the traditional public school that students are residentially assigned to. And if they, they like the remote learning that's going on in the public school, they can still do that and keep that option on the table. But they would be able to take some of that funding to go to a in-person private school or a pandemic pod or a micro school or other types of uh, lear learning uh, scenarios. And with education savings accounts, it's possible to have state legislatures or even the federal government approve the funding to be used to access uh, connectivity and, and broadband as well. It could be used for any approved, uh, government approved education related expenditure. And I think this could, in theory, fall into that bucket. Let me ask, let me follow up. Uh, how can schools become uh, responsible stewards of making education more accessible via broadband without that becoming a crutch then? Uh, one way to do it is to incentivize the schools to reallocate the existing resources, particularly because uh, my latest study at Social Science Research Network with MIT's uh, Dr. McCready's finds that resources haven't been statistically related to reopening in person, even after you control for things like household income, the age and race distributions, and COVID risk in the area. Meanwhile, we didn't find significant relationships between COVID risk and reopening uh, uh, schools in person. Uh, we also tend to tended to find that uh, political partisanship was a strong predictor, along with a few other studies have found this as well, of reopening in person. So uh, uh, if, I, if I could just follow up again with another question. Uh, you know, in my district, the uh, majority of, the, of our schools were, are open for a five-day learning week, and I know that that's not the norm nationally. In your paper, our school reopening decisions related to funding, you examine the impact of per student expenditures on if schools are open for in-person learning or not. Does the level of funding per student have an impact on the reopening decisions during the COVID pandemic? We don't find any evidence, and this is the only existing study on this topic that's done nationwide. We don't find any evidence uh, that's statistically significant between these funding, whether it's measured by revenues per pupil or expenditures per pupil, even after controlling for a ton of different characteristics in the area, no relationships between funding and being more likely to reopen. If anything, we find that in some cases, the remote districts actually had more, were financially better off than their in-person counterparts. And a Georgetown University study similarly found recently that remote districts were more likely to have surpluses. In Los Angeles, they had about a half a billion dollar surplus estimated for this school year. Okay. Well, thank you very much. My time has expired and I yield back. 
Uh, the gentleman yields back. The gentlewoman from Florida, uh, Kathy Castor, is now recognized for five minutes. Well, I thank my friend, the vice chair, for uh, recognizing me. And another big thank you to Chair Schakowsky for uh, calling this very important hearing on uh, protecting kids online. Uh, Ms. Fox Johnson and Ms. Dr. Amon Eden, uh, your testimony really lays out the harmful effects on children caused by predatory data collection uh, and exposure to inappropriate commercial content. Last Congress, I introduced two bills of uh, the Kids Privacy Act and the Kids Act. The Kids Act, thank you uh, to my colleague Yvette Clark and to Congresswoman Wexton from Virginia for joining me in that effort. They both uh, address the harms caused by uh, this, these kind of activities online by the big tech platforms. And our bills propose to update COPPA and put new play, safeguards in place to protect kids when they're online. So the just to go over a few of the things that, that, that are contained in the bills, uh, expanding protections to young consumers aged 13 to 17, requiring opt-in consent for all individuals under 18, banning companies from providing targeted advertising uh, to kids, increasing the FTC penalty uh, authority, repealing provisions that allow industry self-regulation, and changing the knowledge standard from actual to constructive among a variety of other provisions that really help empower parents and protect kids. So Ms. Fox Johnson, do you agree with those updates to COPPA uh, to protect kids online? And uh, to focus in, are there any that are more important than others or are they important as a package? Uh, thank you, Ms. Castor, and thank you for your leadership on this issue. Uh, we wholeheartedly agree that these updates are critical to COPPA and think that they are critical as a package. For us, some of the most important ones are extending protections to teenagers who, as you've heard, have their own set of risks and vulnerabilities, um, ensuring that sites cannot pretend like they don't have kids. You know, TikTok and YouTube pretended like they didn't have children on their site for years, even though they had nursery rhyme videos in the case of YouTube or clearly had small um, tweens and, and preteens in the case of TikTok. We also think it's critically important that enforcement gets enhanced, um, that COP has been around for over 20 years and the FTC has brought about 30 cases. So we don't think that enforcement is sufficient um, right now. We also think it's critical that certain practices just be flat out off limits. Um, behavioral targeting to young kids is unfair and it should not be allowed no matter what kind of you know consent is allegedly given thank you Do dr amadine uh what do you think um well thank you representative castor um for being a champion for this issue um some of the elements that you mentioned are actually laid out in our um most recent uh, digital advertising policy statement uh, which came out in june of last year from the american academy of pediatrics um, i would love to look over some more legislation um, to see where else we are uh we are uh in in on, on the same page so thank you so much for for that and then uh ms fox johnson the kids act uh, prohibits companies from using design features like autoplay and push alerts or any feature that unfairly encourages a child to spend more time engaging with the platform. The bill also prohibits platforms from amplifying harmful content to children. Are we on the right track here? Uh, once again, a wholehearted yes. Uh, kids get hooked onto autoplay into spending too much time and watching inappropriate content that's pushed on them. Um, they get addicted to the dings and badges that they receive. I mean, there's a reason uh, that we give stickers to children when we want to train them to learn to use the bathroom. This is how they respond to rewards, and this is what tech companies are doing to them now. You know, one way I've I've thought about it um, and and shared it with parents is that if there was a person outside your child's window at home or following them to school, you would call the police. <laughs> you would just not put up with this. Uh, so it shouldn't be any different for our online uh, platforms that just have uh, enormous amounts of influence and they're profiting off of it. So I'm really hopeful. And again, I want to give a big 
thank you to Chair Schakowsky for directing the committee's attention to this very important issue. And then I just add at the end, um, thank good for all of, everyone wants kids back in school and thank goodness President Biden has said, all teachers, everyone that works in a school should be vaccinated. And we passed the American Rescue Plan yesterday to provide the resources for schools and students across the country to operate safely and improve student achievement. Uh, so I think we're all on the same page there too. Thanks, and I yield back. The gentlewoman yields back. Is it my understanding that uh, Chair Chikowski is back? Okay. Um, uh, the gentlewoman yields back, and the next person will be recognized for five minutes is uh, uh, Member Guthrie. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cardenas. I appreciate that very much. Uh, thanks for having this hearing today. Thanks, uh, Chair Sikowski and, and Ranking Member Bill Arrakis. Um, you know, since the COVID-19 pandemic began nearly a year ago, kids, or a year ago, kids have been experiencing extended periods of virtue schooling away from their teachers and their friends. As a result of this increased time, long-standing concerns around digital technology have been brought to the forefront. We continue to continually hear about the need for students to be physically in the classroom, learning and the positive cognitive health benefits it brings to a student. I just want to point out that schools in my hometown, there are two school systems in my home county, Warren County Schools and Bowling Green Independent Schools have been meeting in person uh, to some degree, not everybody at the same time, since August the 24th, the first day of school that was on the books. Uh, most schools in Kentucky spent the summer preparing to allow kids to come safely. When it came time to start schools, the governor recommended schools not start. And my two superintendents said, we prepared, we've been working at it, we got things in place. So they went forward much to a lot of criticism from the governor and, and a lot of people. But I can tell you, if anybody wants to see an example of schools meeting, and kids in session, like not every kid every day, I'm not saying that, but kids, some form of in-person learning since August 24th, prior to there being a vaccine, without any evidence of any school to school, any per student to student um, uh, spread, then they can come to Bowling Green and see how it can be, it can be done because they've been successful with it. And we still have uh, districts in Kentucky that haven't met one day in, in a public setting when one, just a few, Miles down the road has met since August of 24. So it's kind of without incident. It's not like they're, well, we're not going to meet because they've had incident. They're certainly a great example of, of, of schools being open. So, uh, but I started out with some questions for Dr. Uh, Aminadin. Uh, you, you mentioned in your testimony how digital media can negatively impact a child's health and development. In your practice, how do you help parents or legal guardians find the balance for their children between screen time? and physical activity, especially since so many kids are learning online. Uh, thank you, Representative Guthrie, for that question. Um, I have to admit, you know, it's an ongoing challenge. Um, every family is a little bit different. Um, I, I advise them, I try to be a coach for them um, about finding balance, finding moderation. Um, you know, I, I also tell parents to give themselves a break. It's just, there's unprecedented stress on everyone right now. Uh, parents are being pulled in multiple different directions. And the last thing that we want to do is create more, uh, more, more difficult more stress and tension in the home. So what I've been advising families to do, it's really not that different from before the pandemic, but maybe with a few caveats, is to really prioritize mental health and physical health. Um, and, you know, way back when, when we just had TVs to worry about, we would recommend no more than two hours of entertainment or recreational screen time a day. That's not a hard and fast rule, but it, it does help to have some rules. It does help to have some guidelines and guard rails up. Um, but I also tell parents, not to be so hard on themselves or their kids because some days might just be very digital and screen time heavy days, but that's okay. You can work on making the next day a little bit more um, balanced towards physical activity, towards you know in-person interaction with other family members to keep things safe. So really, I'm telling parents to to give themselves a break, but to just practice moderation on 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 a wider scale long term. Well, well, thanks. For that. And Dr. Amanda, have, have you come across research or data that shows reopening schools directly correlates to substantial increases in overall COVID-19 transmissions or hospitalizations from child to child or child to adult uh, spread? So that's an important question. Um, it's not my area of expertise, but I would um, recommend reading the AAP uh, guidance on school reopening because I think that lays it out very nicely. 
Okay, so the schools could reopen safely. I, I think that's what, if you follow the guidance, correct? That's what we did in Bowling Green, and we did it last August. So I just want to point that out. Uh, can I uh, also, uh, to questions for Mr. DeAngelis, in your testimony, you state that a Gallup poll found 86% of parents said that students being separated from classmates and teachers was a challenge uh, for their children. From, research, from your research, have any studies that indicate virtual learning is more suited for kids than in-person learning? And you have about 30 seconds to answer. In general, in general the research suggests that in-person learning is better on average than virtual learning. So I, I don't want to say that, that virtual learning can never work. It can work in certain situations, and it's most likely to work in the best way possible when families voluntarily select into that situation and um, they can make those cost benefit decisions themselves. But on average, we're seeing that there's a lot of harm going on as a result of forced, the forced version of re re remote learning that we're seeing across the country. Thank you. Thank you for that time, Madam Chair. I yield back. Next, uh, I, I, I thank the gentleman for yielding back and I um, now want to um, uh, call on Congresswoman Trahan for um, her five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Madam Chair. So children's time spent with screens has increased dramatically during the pandemic. I know this because I have five kids. My two young girls are six and 10 years old, and they've essentially grown up with electronic devices, but nothing like we've seen this past year. And I want to be clear, it's not because they're home from school, That's as much as it's the go-to during the downtime in the absence of play dates and indoor extracurricular activities. And we do know that the more time children spend on screens, the more they're pulled away from engagement with, with me, parents, siblings, and physical activity. Ms. Fox Johnson, big tech employs mental health experts to use persuasive design techniques aimed to increase engagement. We know this, particularly in apps funded by advertising revenue. Can you explain the ways companies leverage their understanding of our children's cognitive development to keep children on their platform or in their app or network of apps and why that is so harmful? Sure, and thank you, Representative Trahan, for that question. So um, as you said, companies employ all kinds of experts who know how to get to kids and to keep them hooked. They use a variety of different features. One of them is the sort of never ending scroll feature. Um, Instagram found that when they sort of put in a natural pause or an end spot, people were spending less time on their product. And so they then decided to move that decision back and put in more content. So kids just get a constant stream of new information. Another feature that is really problematic for kids is seeing how many likes their own photos get or how much engagement from their friends. Teenagers particularly are social creatures. They're looking for validation. And this is a way to have how many people like them and how many people like their friends, you know, numerically listed publicly for everyone. Um, another way that social media keep companies keep kids engaged is through autoplay. Uh, they can't step away because the next video is already starting. And as has been mentioned here, that video was tailor made often to appeal to them. So there are a variety of ways that keep that that social media companies right now are, are using their design tactics to keep kids hooked. Thank you. And I see it up close in, in my own home. Autoplay is the bane of my existence. Uh, Dr. Amandine, in your testimony, you highlight that increased media exposure, especially ad-based, is correlated with poor eating habits and loss of sleep. And the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that parents of children uh, ages six and older place consistent limits on the time spent using media, specifically lower quality media. I have that right. Is that correct? Um, yes. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, so, of course. Sorry, so, go ahead. Oh, no, I, I guess what I'm hearing today is that even parents who are trying to do the right thing, trying to keep their children healthy by limiting certain types of digital media using um, uh, uh, every tactic they have to deploy, they're coming face to face with products that have been designed to keep our children on their apps longer. Uh, an end goal that is counter to the recommendations of our pediatricians. You know, Ms. Fox Johnson, if products can be engineered to keep users endlessly engaged, I imagine that these same products could be designed to encourage healthier behaviors as well. 
what policy changes would incentivize, would lead to that shift? Definitely. Products can be engaged right now to be healthier, um, but since we don't see companies doing that on their own, uh, we really like Congress to act and help them along. In the United Kingdom, the Age Appropriate Design Code uh, requires that companies build the best interests of children into products from the ground up with their design. You're not supposed to use nudges in ways that harm children. You're not supposed to use their information in targeted ads or in other detrimental ways. Help kids give ways that they can set their own limits. Give them visual cues to stop. Don't use their information to keep them hooked. These are all things companies can do. Well, I appreciate that. And I, you know, I'm not going to have time for my next battery of questions, which is uh, not introduce them to Facebook Messenger kids, which is going to get them hooked and, uh, and um, using Facebook at an age earlier than they need be. Uh, so look, parenting is hard. Parenting during a pandemic is immensely hard. I can only hope that this last year and this hearing today highlights the need for Congress to address urgently uh, the ad-based business incentives that are pervasive in our digital economy. I thank you all for your testimony and for your deep knowledge, and I yield back. Well, I thank the gentlewoman. I had no idea. You are, uh, when you talk about parenting, that you have five children. So I learned something uh, something new today. Um, Congressman Bouchon, you have five minutes for your questions. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And uh, I'm a parent of four children. Three of them are grown, but I still have a high school junior. And so I can tell you that uh, even with strong parenting, which I think my wife and I have done over the years to help our children deal with the online ons onslaught of information, that even with that, it is a challenge. And uh, I do think Congress needs to address some of these issues as have been outlined today. You know, but after a year of shutdowns remote, and remote learning uh, and the hardships ar that have arisen from COVID pandemic, we need, we have learned that there are some real costs to being, being in distance learning all year, physical and mental health costs. Uh, and as I mentioned, I'm the father of a high school junior. She's a great student. It's not affecting her much. Uh, we don't have to prod her to make her classes, uh, but I can tell you that across my district, when I talk to educators, some students, uh, you know, when they do roll, uh, never get on line or only sporadically do it and are, are not uh, really technologically uh, present during the instruction. In addition, uh, there's access to broadband issues, particularly, I can tell you, in my area of affecting rural America in the same way that affects urban America. If you look at a map of the United States and and look at the percentage of students that don't have access to consistent internet, it's shocking, honestly. So we need to open our schools in person with the best available data, protecting our students and our teachers and employees. Um, but we need to do this again based on the science that's out there and the guidance that's there, uh, rather than relying on politics. So, Mr. DeAngelis, uh, in, in school learning afforded children access to physical fitness activities uh, that are often not available for millions of students at home. This is something we, we forget about because my daughter is on a crew team and they haven't been on the water uh, now in almost a year. They're, they're at home uh, on rowing machines if they have one. Um, so that could be gym class, extracurricular clubs, activities and sports. What are some of the barriers that you expect uh, in getting these programs and activities back up and running once in-person learning resumes? And what can Congress do to make sure those efforts go as smoothly as possible? Yeah, I mean, this is just another uh, unintended consequence of keeping schools closed. We all kind of anticipated the learning loss, but then we started to see job market impacts disproportionately impacting women. We've seen mental health issues on the rise. And then now we're seeing also physical problems um, and, and increases in obesity probably related to the decrease in sports activity. So one way to incentivize the schools to reopen in person is to not uh, pass stimulus bills that are, that are uh, not uh, contingent upon reopening schools in person, given that all teachers are, are vaccinated, which I think that water's already under the bridge. But another way to incentivize the reopening of schools, and there are a couple of bills in Congress floating around right now 
I think one was introduced yesterday, that would reallocate uh, nearly all federal uh, education dollars from institutions to individuals, which would provide strong incentives for the public schools to reopen their doors in person, as, as has been found in the Brown University study, finding that competition was generally late, related to a higher likelihood of reopening the schools in person. And I just want to point out something that you pointed out was a great point, that there are a lot of inequities that are a result of this, because a lot of the families that are the most advantaged do have choices at the moment. They can afford to pay for private school tuition and fees out of pocket. They can afford to move to a school district that is offering in-person instruction. They can afford to pay for a tutor at home. They can afford for the best remote learning services. So the bet so we're really having a conversation about what kind of access will the least advantaged have when it comes to educational services? Because this whole debate has really not affected the most advantaged in society. So it is leading to inequities, and I'm glad you pointed that out. Yeah, I mean, I you know, as we're having a hearing on the dangers of uh, on and the online activities that our children are exposed to, you know, uh, we're still having a tremendous number of students who are um, who have no choice; they have to be online and. I can tell you, even with my daughter, who, like I said, who's a good student, I, we had to, we still have to set a 10 minutes an hour, no social, no social media, because while she's on her computer, she also has her phone. Um, and so we need to get kids back into a, a better environment. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that can be done. I mean, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics has said, put out some guidelines, as has been mentioned. Um, in my district in southwest Indiana and west central Indiana, schools have mostly been open since last fall uh, with proper guidelines um, in place. And have there been some COVID cases? A few. But overall, consistent with what's happening around the country, not that many. So, um, uh, Madam Chairwoman, I can't see the time clock, so please remind me if my time is up because I'm Your on Your time call. is up. Okay, then I yield back. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Um, Mr. McNerney, you are next. You're recognized now for five minutes for your questions. Well, I thank the chairwoman for holding this hearing. Uh, it's an important issue that uh, tech companies have this hold on our children and we need to explore that, uh, whether there's a pandemic or not. I'm very concerned about the techniques being used by some tech, uh, tech companies that result in addictive behaviors in children. Some of this seems like the addictive techniques used in gambling. For example, many video games and apps have children use real money to purchase in-game rewards or the so-called loot boxes. And they often do this, the tech companies do this in manipulative ways. So according to a recent survey in the UK, one in six children in Britain has stolen money from their parents to play uh, for video game loot boxes. I wouldn't be surprised to see similar statistics like that in the United States. This is a worrisome sign of what effects these features are having on children. Um, Dr. Um, Aminadine, um, can you explain how gambling-like games are harmful for children? Uh, sure, thank you very much, Representative uh, McNerney. Um, anything that would encourage kids to stay engaged um, and you know could lead to addictive tendencies is a concern uh, for, for children's health and mental health. Um, these in-app purchases are another thing that we as pediatricians believe should be banned, um, particularly since uh, it's it's you know, it's it's something that's really outside uh, a, a child's level of ability to to resist, um, and it is very concerning that that children in the UK uh, were actually stealing their parents' money or using things without permission. Um, that sort of persuasive design is really dangerous. Um, it's bad for mental health. It's bad for physical health, and we strongly stand against that. But because that really is targeting a very vulnerable section of our society. Well, so, do you believe that that these loot boxes set up children for addiction to gambling later in life? So addiction is a very complex issue. Um, it's multifactorial, um, and it's difficult to really say with certainty and with a good evidence base that this would set them up for an addiction, um, but it's certainly not good for them. Um, I think we would prefer to call it problematic internet use. Um, and, you know, as we look at the DSM-5 manual, the manual of uh, psychiatric uh, issues, they have mentioned, you know, the concern of internet gaming disorder, but haven't officially uh, laid a diagnosis to it. So just to be clear um, and precise, I would 
hesitate to use the actual word addiction. Well, thank you. Um, moving on, the industry's response uh, to concerns about these loot boxes to require disclosure in app stores or on video games that a particular game contains an in-app purchase. Um, Ms. Fox Johnson, how effective is disclosure in these cases, especially with regard to apps and games intended for children? Thank you for that question, Representative McNerney. In general, we think disclosures are not that effective. I mean, it's a, important to put them at the point of purchase, but often these kids can't read, so they don't know what in-app purchase means. And then within the game, there can often not be disclosures. Uh, the purchases themselves, sometimes it's not clear to kids that they're even using real money because uh, things are referred to as, you know, buy gems or sparkle wands. So we do not think that kids and their parents know that they're spending money. And I think that's clear from the fact that, you know, millions of dollars of money has had to be refunded to consumers when the Federal Trade Commission brought cases against some of these platforms like um, Apple and, and Google and Amazon for, for sort of bilking kids and their parents out of money. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about artificial intelligence at this point. AI and machine learning are used in targeting behavioral advertising and persuasive design tactics that we're seeing today and discussing today. This practice is, is everywhere. Compared to adults, children and teens um, are more trusting of privacy invasive technologies like GPS tracking. And I think that poses a major risk for children divulging sensitive information. Um, Ms. Fox Johnson, how do platforms and developers use AI and machine learning in their user interfaces to better target children and monetize their data? Um, as you said, Representative Indurney, they're tracking them everywhere. The kids don't realize that their location is being shared because they think they haven't actively put it in. They don't realize that the conversation they have with their smart toy is not staying on their toy, but is going into a data ecosystem and companies use all this information to figure out precisely what that kid might want to buy or might want to do next and use it to create commercial profiles of kids at very young ages. Oh, yeah, well, I agree. Well, thank you. I'm going to run out of time, so I yield back, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you. And now, Mr. Pence, it is your turn. For thank you, Chair Schakowsky and Ranking Member Bill Arrakis for holding this hearing. And thank you to the witnesses for appearing before us today. This pandemic has impacted us all. It has been particularly troublesome for our youth as, as the witnesses uh, talked about today. Students learning remotely are missing out on higher quality instruction from the in-person attention during formative years of their development. I'm concerned that those lost opportunities will lead to damaging learning gaps, setting back an entire generation. Instead of having exposure to social connections with their peers at school, students in virtual settings across the country are often isolated, spending more time on the internet and away from their friends. Comparatively, in my state, Indiana, Hoosiers underwent local community-led efforts last summer to keep our kids in school. Together with parents, administrators, and local health officials, schools in my district developed comprehensive strategies to ensure students and teachers could safely return to the classroom, which they did. And that's exactly what they did. Every one of the counties in my district have schools that have returned to the classroom with notable success. Having students in person provides structure and stability that is so important for the mental and emotional well being of children. Beyond the attention received in the classroom, Clubs, sports, teams, and other student organizations provide an invaluable collective learning environment that cannot be replicated from a Zoom connection, like leadership skills and social skills. Recently, I had the opportunity to meet with bright young students at St. Nicholas Catholic School and Batesville High School, a public school. Both schools are prime examples of how local stakeholders are best positioned to develop school safety strategies that fit the unique educational needs of their community. From my discussions with these students, their teachers and administrators, one thing remained clear, students feel more purpose when they are in school and involved in person. 
I share the concerns of my colleagues that the increased online presence of children can be detrimental to their health and safety. Shifting children away from in-person learning and towards a digital life has, has surely sentenced them to more time for predators to prowl, which is another argument for in-school learning. Dr. DeAngelis, I'm afraid of a scenario of dueling outcomes for students that participate virtually versus students that participate in person. In your testimony, you mentioned substantial achievement gaps between these two groups, specifically leading to increased dropout rates and impacts on their future earnings. Can you please expand on what this will mean for our future generation of, in particular, community leaders that are losing this sports and, inter and social interaction? Yeah, I'd first like to point out, look, this is leading to inequity. So this is hitting the least advantaged in the community the hardest, particularly because the most advantaged have access to in-person alternatives or good uh, versions of remote virtual learning at home or even uh, uh, have more uh, ability to cover the costs associated with home-based education. But to, to your point, McKinsey and Company, a nationwide analysis in 2020 on two separate occasions found that uh, they, they estimated that achievement gaps would increase. And achievement gaps are already uh, a, a horrible thing in the United States that we need to remedy. Uh, but the gaps by race, they estimate to increase by 15 to 20 percent, and they estimate dropout rates to increase by two to nine percentage points, translating to about uh, 232,000 to 1.1 million additional ninth to 11th graders dropping out of high school, which could translate to about 60 to 80 thousand dollars in a reduction of lifetime earnings, which is a huge problem. Uh, obviously, and there's there's a lot of evidence. This is just one source from McKinsey and Company finding these exacerbated inequities from keeping the schools closed. Uh, so the best option is to give families options to allow them to choose the uh, in person or remote or hybrid learning setting of their of their choice, or even better, allocate the money to the families so that more families can access other in person alternatives which in Indiana, we have school choice. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, I yield back. Gentleman yields back, and now I call on Mr. Cardenas um, for five minutes for questions. Thank you very much, Madam Chairwoman. I appreciate the honor of uh, being the sit-in chair for just a little bit. It was a bit addicting, but I, 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 I relinquished it. <coughs> um, okay, th thank you so much. Appreciate it, uh, I'm bringing this a committee together on this issue, uh, Madam Chairwoman Schakowsky, and also uh, Ranking Member uh, Bill Arrakis. Um, appreciate this opportunity for us to hear from all uh, many different perspectives about what our families and children and are going through, but more importantly, uh, being able to dialogue and discuss maybe what some of the solutions are so we can have a better environment, better world, so that our children are less negatively affected by all of this. Um, I'm I'm a, a father and, and uh, more importantly a, a proud grandfather. Uh, the two grandchildren, ages two and four, and yes, they are on devices already. Um, and we need to protect every uh, child as much as possible. And um, of course, the responsibility of the individual family raising those children is paramount. But at the same time, I think it's important that government understands that we do have a responsibility of making sure that the guidelines and the lanes in which these incredibly prolific and lucrative businesses are uh, in our homes and in the eyeballs and the minds and hearts of our families and our children. And also I, I would say that um, it's unfortunate that um, we, we speak of who's negatively affected the most or who in America might not be as prepared as others to, uh, to protect themselves and to protect their children from the potential negative effects and harmful effects of what what could be going on, but but let me tell you this, I think it's important that everybody understand that, that th these negative effects, they do not see color, they do not see race, they do not see gender. A child is a child is a child. And I believe that because um, about 60% of all children in America are white, it is disproportionately affecting white children. Uh, and, and I just wanna point that out because I think that some people uh, get the misinterpretation that all we care about is black and brown children. Um, we care about all children. And I don't want anybody to think that because we 
mentioned minority children or or poor children in general that we are leaving out the 60 percent of the children in america who are white we are protect we are looking to protect every child regardless of of their background um what one of the things um let, let me just go to my first question because <clears throat> time is fleeting dr Minadin. In your testimony, you mentioned that for infants and toddlers still developing cognitive language, uh, sensor motor and social emotional skills, screen time of, the, uh, of any kind is typically discouraged. What do you know about the long-term effects early exposure to technology like tablets and smartphones can have on a child's development in this area? Uh, well, thank you for that question, uh, Vice Chair Cardenas. Um, I'll share what we know and what we don't know. Frankly, there are still a lot of unknowns and research is evolving. But what we do know from early studies on tablets and devices and apps is that there's very little benefit and there's a strong potential for harm um, for children under 18 months of age. For children between the ages of 18 months and two years, if it's a high quality educational app that is uh, that involves parental engagement with the app and the child, and then the parent teaches back after they've finished using the app, there can potentially be some benefit there. Um, but we do know, again, from decades of research that uh, early introduction to, to screen time, um, even if it's purported to be educational, can actually have the opposite effect. For example, um, we had the baby Einstein videos from, from several years ago. One of my colleagues in pediatrics actually did a study on that and found that children who um, whose families used the baby Einstein videos versus those who didn't use any kind of screen time um, were actually having developmental delays in terms of expressive language skills. So we do know that there can be harms, um, but that we really recommend and uh, again, uh, mindful, mindful use for older kids because there can certainly be benefits um, with certain good educational programming. Thank you, Ms. Amini Dean, uh, for that important information, those facts. Uh, I hope that to uh, after today's hearing, we'll keep these issues in focus. And that's why today, along with my colleague, Rep. Trey, and I introduced the Youth Mental Health Suicide There's Prevention so Act, a bill authorizing the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA, to provide funding to school districts for a variety of positive mental health promotion and suicide prevention purposes. Like I said, we all have the interests of every child at heart, and I think that it's important that Congress play its, its, its current, uh, excuse me, its appropriate role and right-sized role in making sure that we create and, and make sure that the lanes are being followed and the lanes are created so that our children uh, can uh, remain protected. Thank you. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. And now, um, Congresswoman Lesko, it is yours for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And thank you, colleagues. It's good to see you. Um, you know, th this subject is very important, protecting our children. Uh, I have uh, four grandchildren. Uh, two of them are uh, elementary school age. And so uh, protecting them, they're always, they're always on their phones, they're always on their tablets. This is a very important issue. Um, I totally agree uh, with the subject and I have asked my staff during this hearing, actually I've left and asked them to write me up decision memos on some of these bills that both the Democrats and Republicans on this, in this subcommittee have said that they've introduced. And so I will do that and get back with you on, on my decision on those. I also totally agree with Mr. DeAngelis. Um, I'm from Arizona. We have lots of school choice in Arizona. Uh, it started in 1994, I think, when we opened up. Uh, not only parents could go to different school districts that weren't in their neighborhood, uh, with their kids, but also charter schools uh, were legalized in Arizona. And so we have many, many, many charter schools. I also uh, introduced legislation when I was in the state legislature on empowerment scholarship accounts, which are a way for uh, in, in now special needs children uh, to go to private schools using public funds. Um, and so, Mr. DeAngelis, I've worked with Reason Foundation before on pension reform, bipartisan pension reform when I was in Arizona, and you guys do great work. 
I totally agree with the concept of more competition, more choices for parents and students. Um, I do want to uh, read, I want to show uh, everybody an article from an Arizona, Tucson, Arizona newspaper. And it's entitled, No Way to Check on Hundreds of Kids Missing from Schools Across Tucson. And I, I would like to submit it uh, unanimous consent to include it in the record, Madam Chairman. Uh, but I'm going to read some uh, things. From all, all these will be added at the end of the uh, hearing. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, some of the things in the article were very disturbing. It says it's unclear what's happening in the lives of over 1,100 young people who never show up for online school or only attend sporadically. The combined total of students unaccounted for in Tucson's seven other major school districts is at least 1,160, with some students missing since last spring. On average, calls to an abuse hotline run by Arizona's Department of Child Services are down 25 to 30 percent. The agency's director attributes the decrease largely to schools not being held in person. This lack of oversight by teachers and administrators is happening at a time when families and parents are under tremendous stress due to layoffs, social isolation, and sometimes illness. Uh, Tucson, the largest school district, Tucson Unified School District, is still working to identify how many kids have fallen off the radar. That means the number of unaccounted for children is, is likely much higher than the 1160 number coming out of the other school districts across the county. Tucson Unified School District has had an enrollment decline of 2,600 students since this time last year. And the reason I bring this up is because what we've talked about and others is we need to get kids back in school. And in Arizona, uh, my grandkids go to a charter school. And guess what? Their charter school has been open almost the entire time and they have not had a COVID outbreak. Also, because some of the district schools would not reopen, uh, parents have been very creative and they're doing these micro schools. So they're, even though they're paying all the taxes, the property taxes, everything to the schools, they're hiring their own teacher, like groups of parents get together and hire their own teacher. And that's why what Mr. DeAngelis says is so important. And, you know, I guess I want to give my last 15 seconds to you, Mr. DeAngelis. I took up most of the time, but tell me why that's important. Yeah, I mean, uh, Wall Street Journal wrote an article about the teachers' union's tiny little en uh, enemy, which was uh, Prenda Microschools over there in Arizona. Um, and they've been very successful. You can uh, socially distance better with small settings in a microschool. And the reality is the most advantaged families without school choice already have those opportunities. And they're able to get that one-on-one -on -one attention with the kids and also have more social interaction uh, so we might as well fund the students directly like Arizona does through the education savings account and allow more families to have access to those alternatives. Thank you so much and I yield back. Okay, and um, now I am happy to call on uh, Congresswoman Clark. Welcome back and it is your turn for five minutes. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. And I thank our ranking member, uh, Bill Arrakis, for uh, convening today's hearing. I thank our witnesses for your expert testimony here today. As we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated, exacerbated many issues that are plaguing our nation. We have seen a dramatic increase in the digital, uh, the adoption of digital devices due to individuals and families working and learning from home. However, along with the uptick in digital device usage, there has been an increase in screen time across our nation during the transition to life online. This transition has had a tremendous impact on one of our nation's most vulnerable and appreciable populations, children. With this increase, I'm concerned about the exposure of advertisements that children are now bombarded with. These ads are concerningly harmful to, demo to a demographic that is unable to comprehend their persuasive impact. Ms. 
Fox Johnson, in your testimony, you mentioned a Pew Research Center report that stated 53% of children younger than 11 view YouTube daily with 35% viewing multiple times per day. Additionally, you go on to support that we have discussed time and time again, children have uh, from low income communities and communities of color are more likely to utilize mobile devices and have limited connectivity, which limits the productivity of this uptick in screen, uh, in screen time. Uh, this is all very concerning. However, as I stated, screen time is up for young kids and they are being targeted with ads from companies, influencers, kid influencers on social media now more than ever before the, the, the pandemic even struck. So my question is to Ms. Fox Johnson, and I think uh, our chairwoman may have posed this something similar to you earlier. In your testimony, you mentioned that children are uniquely vulnerable to digital harms for a variety of reasons, including increased screen time and the fact that their brains are still in development. What strategies can we use to protect our children from digital manipulation and ad targeting? And how do we hold big tech companies and advertisers accountable? Sure, and thank you, Representative Clark, for your question and for your leadership in this area. There are lots of things that um, companies and advertisers could do to be more accountable to children. Um, first, we need to make any disclosures of ads more meaningful. A surprising number of teenagers can't even tell that an ad is an ad when it has an orange box that says ad around it. We also should ban advertising techniques that take advantage of kids' feelings of special relationships with hosts and with cartoon characters and not allow for product endorsements. We should ban advertisements and endorsement ads for unhealthy food and drink, which primarily targets or disproportionately targets communities of color. Um, we should stop companies from allowing kids to get more content or more re rewards from viewing more advertisements. And we should stop companies from turning teenagers and kids into unwitting product promoters themselves um, by conscripting them into paid posts that uh, feature their liking of a product to their friends. These are things that Congress can do, and they're also things that the Federal Trade Commission should be able to work on by updating its endorsement guidelines. And in the meantime, again, we think companies can take some steps themselves and don't need to wait. Thank you very much, Fox Jackson. Dr. Amenodine, uh, Amina Dean, excuse me. Um, kids are not just learning in front of screens. They are spending their leisure time there too. Utilizing platforms like YouTube and TikTok with deceptive or hidden ads may be harder for children to detect. Due to the rise of social media influencer and kid influencer, should this type of in influencer marketing uh, be allowed to target kids and what unintended consequences might this have on their development? Uh, well, thank you so much for the question, Representative Clark. And I wanted to say I agree with everything that uh, Ms. Uh, Fox Johnson said. I think those are excellent suggestions. Um, in addition to that, specifically with regard to the question about kid influencers and unboxing videos, that really is a form of deceptive advertising. Um, as Ms. Fox Johnson er, mentioned, um, kids feel like they're just watching a friend, yet it's really a targeted marketing technique. Um, so w the AAP supports banning um, banning that kind of advertising towards children, paid advertising. Um, and I apologize, it looks like we ran out of time. Sorry. Well, very well. If you would just submit uh, your response to our committee, that would be great. We, we really want to be aggressive in this space. And I thank all of our witnesses for testifying today. Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. And now, uh, Mr. Uh, Armstrong, it is yours for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I have a 13 year old daughter. I have an 11 year old son. I was a high school baseball coach uh, a long time ago, still the best job I ever had. Um, and so I appreciate the conversation, particularly about the, I, I mean, my kids went through hybrid school, they went through in person, but I, I really do appreciate the fact that we are talking about, I mean, there are just, in every single school across the country, there is a kid who that is the great equalizer in his or her life. And without it, they don't, we're, we're leaving them behind. And it's a, sometimes it's 
poverty issues, sometimes it's family life issues, sometimes it's all kinds of different things. But one of the greatest things about COVID and maybe one of the only good things is that it happened now and we are capable of doing these things and technology has allowed us to do these things. But there is no doubt in my mind that we have to get them back into sports, the clubs, into school as quickly as possible or these gaps are gonna continue to grow. But I wanna talk a little bit about something that's going to continue to plague us as members of Congress outside of schools reopening, and that's how we deal with personal information and particularly with more screen time coming online. And COPA covers the collection use and disclosure of children's personal information. The FTC regulations pursuant to COPA, COPA define personal information to include in part geolocation information sufficient to identify street name and name of city or town. This definition means that course geolocation data on a child, which can be a zip code, county, region, et cetera, can be collected without direct notice of verifiable parental consent. I'm not convinced we should be collecting any of this data on, on kids without parental consent. And I understand that zip codes are widely used geographic boundaries, but some zip codes in densely populated areas narrow, narrow you down to a very specific location. And there might be a few legitimate reasons to collect this information on minors, but I, I just fear the potential harm may outweigh those, those reasons. And we can't view non-consensual course geolocation data collection as standalone data points that only show child specificity. Because while it's covered in COPA's definition of personal information, there are so many other data points when viewed in combination with course geolocation data can further specify a child's location, their habits, their identity. I said, this question is probably for Ms. Ms. Fox. Why are we collecting this from minors? Thank you, Representative Armstrong. I mean, that's an excellent collection. question. Why are companies collecting this information if not to use it to target or profile a kid? There's no reason that they need to know one zip code over the other to, say, determine language or country or things like that. Um, one of the things that we really like in the Kids Privacy Act from Representative Castor is that it would update what forms of information are covered in COPPA and ensure that in statute and not just in the FTC rule, they're taking um, full look at the modern ways that companies track and monitor kids and monetize kids these days. And then, and then this is another question, because I think we have to start having this conversation as well. Does this conversation change, particularly as you're involving minors, if we look at data through a property lens instead of a privacy lens? There's lots of discussions in the broader privacy landscape right now about if, if data is, uh, if my privacy is my property, or in Europe, if my privacy is more of a fundamental right. However you look at it, I think for kids, it's not something that we think that they should be giving up or be forced to give up. Um, it's not really a choice. Uh, it's sort of a false way of looking at consent. And children should have the right to do what they wish and to learn and to grow without being surveilled and monitored at every step of the way. And then just lastly, there's a reason we have juvenile courts. There's a reason we, we, we treat juveniles in the court system significantly different than we do adults. There's a reason we seal records when they're 18, but we are we're continuing down this path of holding people accountable when their brains are still developing. We have professional athletes getting in trouble for tweets they said when they were 13. So, Mr. Armstrong, Mr. Armstrong, we're gonna have to ask for a response in, um, in writing to this year. Well, uh, over time, but, um, oh, I'm wrong. I, I'm <laughs> sorry. I'm looking now at 25, 24, no. sorry. Go ahead. No, and, I'm but, so and, sorry. and GDPR, there are technical challenges with right to be forgotten. California has got a law, but I, I, we really have to start having conversations about allowing minors and allowing parents and allowing guardians to be able to block information that ch children are putting online. Um, I mean, they have to function. My daughter's 13. I wish she didn't have a phone, but if she didn't have a phone, she would, I mean, she wouldn't be able to communicate in the 21st century society. So now I am over time and I yield back. No, no, no. Uh, give, give her a couple seconds to respond. No, I took your time. Go ahead. Sure. I would thank you. I would say that we, we fully agree you shouldn't, what you do at 10 should not come back and haunt you when you're 40. So we support the rights for kids to be able to erase our information and take control of what they have inadvertently or intentionally shared at a young age. 
And I would just end with this. I think there's probably members of Congress on both sides of the aisle that may not be here if we all had social media when we were 13 years old. <laughs> okay. Um, see, and, and now, um, Debbie Dingle, I know you've been waiting patiently. And thanks for uh, sitting uh, with us the whole time. And it is yours for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Schakowsky. And thank you to all of the witnesses for being here today. And I'm not the only member sitting here patiently because this no. subject is so important. Many modern digital media platforms are designed to keep users engaged and incentivize the re-engagement, leading to compulsive habits or what some refer to as addiction to their devices. A lot of adults too, I might add. But we've seen an increasing number of reports correlating time on digital media, social media, and electronics to mental health issues in children and adolescents, among a variety of other serious impacts, including obesity, anxiety, and what my, what really deeply disturbs me, electronic bullying. In an increasingly digital age, we need to be vigilant in reevaluating how online content is consumed by children and ensure that they receive meaningful protections to their privacy and their mental and physical well-being. So I want to ask some questions focused on these protections. Influencers marketing is, is now a billion dollar industry and the fastest growing method for acquiring customers online. Many of today's top influencers are children themselves, so-called kid influencers with masses followings on social media. Ms. Fox Johnson, has the FTC brought any enforcement actions against influencers or their sponsors that have a significant child audience? Thank you, Representative Dingell. Um, that's a great question. The FTC has not. And in fact, their current endorsement guidelines don't even talk about kids or teens or special issues that might pertain to them. Some influencers, including those targeting children, are just as well known or even more well-known than the brands that they promote. Yet the FTC has tended to focus its enforcement actions against the brands and not the individual influencers, limiting action against individual influencers to just warning letters. Ms. Fox Johnson, have the FTC actions been effective? What more should FTC be doing? Um. I would say the FTC actions have not been effective. Um, there have been multiple complaints filed against the kid influencers. Um, sometimes these folks are making, you know, twenty million dollars a year uh, hawking products to children in ways that are appear to not look like advertisements and what appear to be just sort of sharing a game with a friend. Um, so I think the FTC, as I mentioned, should update their endorsement guidelines. They should look at banning this endorsement guide for, for young kids, certainly, and ideally for teens, and for all endorsements in general, because sometimes teens are watching particularly things that adults might be watching. They need to make sure that disclosures are effective, because right now the hashtag ad that comes at the end of some long piece of information is not sufficient. I agree. Social media platforms facilitate and make a lot of money from influencer marketing. Ms. Fox Johnson, what responsibility do social media companies have to protect kids from manipulative marketing? And what can the FTC do to hold them accountable? Social media companies can take more responsibility, particularly when they're dealing with um, individual influencers or other people. They can do a better job of being more transparent in ways that are proven to be understood by kids and teens about what is an ad and what's native content. Um, the FTC, who hasn't done as much as we wish they could have done in all of these areas and in, in social media and privacy, they need more resources so they can do more enforcement and they can update and codify the regulations and guidelines. Dr. Amina Dean, I want to ask you at least one question before my time's up. Is the concern that the media consumption habits developed by children and adolescents during the pandemic will continue post pandemic? And should we be concerned by the potential impacts in terms of their health and privacy? 
Well, thank you, Representative Dingle. Um, I think it is a huge concern, and I suspect that this will continue to be an issue long after the pandemic. Um, as we've mentioned earlier, um, increased social media use, increased screen time was an issue well before the pandemic ever started, obviously increased. Um, but, you know, making little changes aren't, uh, it won't mean that everything goes back to normal. I think it will continue to be an issue. We have somewhat mixed data. I am uh, grateful to you for bringing up the concerns about mental health uh, and the connection to social media. We have conflicting information. Uh, for some kids, you know, it has led to sadness, um, or I guess it's correlated with sadness, possibly depression, but for other kids, it's actually been a lifeline. You know, for marginalized kids, sometimes finding community online can be a huge source of support. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have to yield back, but I will say our children are 100% of our future, and it's our responsibility to ensure their safety and security online. Thank you. And now I call on Mr. Dunn um, for five minutes for his questioning. Uh, thank you very much, Chairwoman Schakowsky. I'm uh, glad the committee has convened this important hearing. The long-term impacts on our children are one of the greatest travesties of the COVID-19 pandemic and lockdowns. As some of our witnesses have noted, the amount of time that kids spend in front of a screen has been a health concern for uh, quite some time. The problem has been vastly exacerbated by the pandemic. And the science is clear, the evidence is abundant, the schools across the country have the ability to reopen safely today. Uh, I also appreciate Dr. DeAngelis rightly pointing out that the uh, schools in America are largely closed purely due to politics. I'm grateful to Florida uh, Governor Ron DeSantis, who led the way in reopening, and due to that fact, all schools in my district, Florida's second district, are safely open for in-person learning at this time. Uh, parents across the country know that the best thing for their kids is to be in school. This even includes the heads of powerful teachers' unions who drop their own children off at a private school. At the same time, they're fighting to keep public school kids out of school behind a computer screen at home. I've been an advocate for school choice for a long time. I think the best thing we can do for school-aged children is to empower their parents to seek out the best educational opportunities available. So let me start with a question for Dr. DeAngelis. Uh, uh, families are especially vulnerable to the economic and educational impacts of COVID-19 and the lockdowns. Many parents have been forced to work longer hours, provide essential services and work from remote locations. This obviously impacts their ability to provide adult supervision uh, for their own children. So briefly, would you say school choice allows households of all socioeconomic groups the best chance for the parents to place their students in an educational setting that fits the needs of their individual family? Absolutely, and as I've noted before, the most advantaged families already have school choice. They can already afford to live in the neighborhoods that are residentially assigned to the best public schools in America. They're more likely to be able to afford to pay out of pocket for private school in-person learning. They're more likely to be able to afford the cost of home-based learning in micro schools and pandemic pods. Funding students directly through programs like uh, the ones in Florida allow more families to access alternatives. So it leads to more equity and more freedom at the same time. And I think that's a, a lot of the reason why Florida has done a, such a good job when it comes to reopening public schools. Well, you're very articulate on that. You shared a statistic I believe is worth repeating. Uh, Florida, a state that spends about $10,700 per student per year has been able to essentially fully reopen its schools. While California, which spends about 38% more per student has kept their doors closed. With your research on this issue, what role should the federal government play to incentivize the state governments to minimize screen time and return to the classroom? Well, it's not a good idea to pass stimulus bills to uh, <laughs> that, that, that don't make the money uh, contingent upon actually reopening the schools because then the schools can just get more money and then fail to reopen the schools, especially in context of my new study with Christos Macrides from MIT, finding no relationship whatsoever in any of our models or analytic techniques between resources and reopening the schools in person. And as you pointed out, just looking at places like Florida and California, California spends 38% more per pupil per year, according to the U.S. Census Bureau. 
And yet, Florida is mostly... Uh, I'm going to cut you off, Dr. Yeah, Ann, just because I want to get to a couple more questions. But you've been very articulate, and I appreciate your presence here. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Amanudin, uh, thank you for your testimony. You work as a pediatrician, as a doctor myself. I know the challenges you face and appreciate the work you do for our uh, children. Uh, COVID-19 and the lockdowns have drastically changed the lives of all Americans, especially our students who find themselves sitting in front of a computer more and playing outside less, along with a complete absence of formal physical education. Uh, I noticed that Kelly Armstrong had been a high school coach at one time. He knows this. Uh, in your testimony, you recommend specifying times where uh, families turn off the screens and play. Can you speak to the long-term impacts of less outside play and physical education that student, uh, students experienced over the last year? Uh, sure. Thank you, Representative Dunn. Um, well, I uh, have an opportunity to refer you to another AAP policy on um, on the importance of play and um, the importance of making sure that children have a safe environment to play in outside. Um, you specifically asked about the long-term impacts of, of essentially sedentary activity um, and lack of physical activity. You know, we've known for years, as we've seen screen time increase, device use increase, um, that, uh, that non-active time is not a good thing for kids. Um, I've been working so with parents. I'm going I'm to ask you to, to, to put that in the, the written responses because my time is elapsed. I'm asking you to okay. also ask you to, if, to, to, to conjecture in your response to that question. Uh, you know, we know that this a uh, lot of screen time is bad for kids. Is it also bad for members of Congress? And so I'd like that, uh, you know, just consider that option because I think it is. <laughs> I yield back, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, Congresswoman Rice, it is your five minutes for questions right now. Thank you, Chairwoman Schakowsky. Um, Ms. Johnson, I'd like to ask you a, a question. Um, in 2019, the New York State Attorney General and the FTC secured a settlement from Google and YouTube for $170 million for violating the um, COPA. Um, the settlement required Google and YouTube to pay $136 million to the FTC and $34 million to New York for violating COPA. The $136 million penalty is still, I believe, the largest amount the FTC has ever obtained in a COPA case since Congress enacted the law in 1998. Despite that enormous amount of money, two commissioners voted against it citing that the penalty did not go far enough. And one of the reasons was because the cost of doing business, $170 million is nothing compared to the billions of dollars that these companies make from ad revenue. So in your opinion, Ms. Johnson, have these penalties been an effective deterrent for companies who violate the laws that are meant to protect children's privacy? And if not, what steps can the FTC take to deter violations? I think that, I, I hope we really are gonna be able to consider Congresswoman Castro's bill because I think it moves to fix just one of these, this aspect, but just in your opinion, how, you know, is it effective? And if not, how can we make it effective? Thank you, Representative Rice. Um, we agree with the dissenting commissioners that in, in my opinion, it's not effective. It's, um, Google was still able to profit off of its activity and for them, 170 million was so small that they didn't even have to report that to investors. Um, they also got the sort of first mover advantage of taking a bunch of children's personal information, collecting that in violation of law and being able to design better targeting and more addictive and attractive products to kids. And that's not something that they're gonna give up, you know, even if they delete, which sometimes they don't always, companies don't always delete as they're supposed to, the, the data later on. I think that we've seen um, with this settlement and with other settlements in the privacy space, you know, we objected to the Facebook settlement. These are not meaningful deterrents for companies. And so things that the FTC could do, um, luckily with COPPA, it has civil penalty authority, but those fines could be increased. It could get civil penalty authority from Congress in other privacy situations. It could get rulemaking authority. It could, um, right now, in, in general privacy cases, it doesn't even have the ability to fine for the first time of a violation. Um, in addition, we think the FTC needs its own, it needs more resources itself so it can bring cases. Um, attorney generals could get more uh, 
civil penalty authority and the ability to obtain penalties under COPPA. And then also if you let parents sue on behalf of their kids, that's another way to increase enforcement and to improve the landscape. So yeah, I'm glad you brought up the state's attorney general. You know, New York has a very big office with enormous resources, but that is not true of every state in the country. Um, and we want, I believe, state attorneys general to play their critical role in working with the FTC on these types of cases. So what tools do state attorneys general need to continue to bring these cases like New York was able to do? Yes, thank you. And New York is one of the sort of more technologically savvy attorney general's office. And that's something that the attorney general's office and the FTC, again, need more of, too. They need more technologists to understand what's going on um, sort of beneath the very opaque veneer of these tech companies. And we hear from attorney general's offices all the time because we work in a variety of different states that they don't have resources. You might get a great new privacy law, but they'll only be able to bring, you know, one case a year, maybe because they're up against tech companies and they're understaffed and under resourced. Well, you know, that's always the big issue, not just in this field, but others, um, when you deal with cybersecurity issues or the issues that we're talking about today, that these private companies are able to attract all of the talent because of the enormous salaries that they can pay that government agencies like state AGs just simply can't. Um, Dr. Um, Amina, Din, just very quickly, uh, expanding this protection to children between the ages of 13 and 17, what's the impact going to be? I mean, I have a a uh, 15 year old niece and um i worry about you know the impact that these you know living their lives on social media especially with all of this information coming at them the impact how this is going to help 13 and 17 year old vulnerable kids yeah. Uh, thank you, Representative Rice. Um, I think the effect will be huge. I mean, so many teens are online, as you mentioned, they are living their lives online even before the pandemic, um, in in including uh, children under 18 under these protections, I think will have a huge impact um, on mental health, on, on, on multiple other issues too. So thank you for asking that. Thank you all for being here. And I yield back, Madam Chairwoman. The gentleman yields back. And now I call on Representative Soto for five minutes of questions. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. This hearing is about our children being increasingly brainwashed by sophisticated targeting, pop-up ads, autoplays, and algorithms, among other techniques. And the result is they're spending more and more time online. Add in video game addiction, and we see a generation of kids becoming couch potatoes, racking up hours of scrim time and barely going outside. This puts our nation's children, our nation's future at risk. Parents are outreached and increasingly asking for Congress to act. Considering the critical subject, I was a little surprised to see an attempt to shoehorn fake GOP talking points about school reopenings into this very important hearing. So it's important to at least go over the facts briefly. 41 states, both Democrats and Republicans, do not have school opening or closing orders in place. They leave it to school districts. Five states have orders to be open, four states have orders to be partially open. So saying it's a Democratic Republican tra trend is an absolute and total lie. The vast majority of st st states leave this to local school districts to make a decision, as they should because urban districts have different challenges than suburban or rural districts, all in my district. Affluent families have more resources for their children to learn from home. Many American families have to go to work and need their children to attend in-person school. Add in health complex complexities of students and other difficulties, and local school districts and families need this flexibility. In Central Florida, I supported schools reopening, like many Democrats in our state. So what are you really talking about? My wife taught in the public schools at the peak of the pandemic in July and August of last year in Central Florida, in the classroom with a mask on, socially distanced, with kids having plastic barriers. She's a member of the teachers union. She cares about her students and taught them in school without a vaccine, risking her life for the students. So I find it shocking that no one here today has even mentioned the hundreds of teachers who've died of COVID-19. Some students have died. In Florida, we've already had 45,000 plus cases of students, nearly 5,000 teacher cases of COVID-19, 3,000 COVID staff cases, and 7,000 other COVID-related public and private K through 12 school cases. Bashing teachers unions is so predictable for some of you, 
Actually fixing the problem takes work. When we passed the Bipartisan Coronavirus Stimulus and Relief Act in December, some of our colleagues across the aisle joined us. Thank you. 53 of you, including some on this committee, voted against school coronavirus relief funds. Then just yesterday, all of you voted against the American Rescue Act. So what are you talking about? You're complaining about opening schools, then voting against funding for them to do so safely. That's absolutely absurd and the American people know it. Turning back to the subject at hand, many parents have opted for distance learning and this has exacerbated these online addictions. So I wanna go to the Kids Act briefly um, that Kathy Castor had um, put together. And I wanna to talk to Ms. Johnson first. What are you think the most important parts of the Kids Act that we need to pass right away, um, like auto banning and banning push alerts and banning badges? Thank you, Representative Soto. I think that we need to pass all aspects of the kids' play, but the manipulative design that keeps kids hooked and the uh, protections that would prevent against the commercialization of our children and marketing are really important. I also think it's important to note, I would be remiss in not mentioning that schools use a lot of technology too. And we need to update our student privacy laws and other privacy laws because wherever kids are learning, whether they're in the classroom or not, a lot of these schools have bought computers and new technology and they're gonna keep using it no matter where kids are and we need to keep kids protected and safe. Thanks so much, Ms. Johnson. Uh, Dr. Aminadin, uh, what do you think are the most critical parts of the KIDS Act that we need to pass right away? Uh, well, thank you for that question, Representative Soto. Um, again, I'm going to go back to our AAP recommendations, which are nicely outlined in our digital ad policy. I think number one thing is to expand COPA to uh, to ban uh, targeted advertising to children under 18, um, and also to make sure that they have the highest privacy levels uh, possible, um, and to really stop online tracking and data collection of kids. Those are the two most important things. Thanks so much. This is a really important subject. I'm glad we're uh, handling it today, Madam Chair. Uh, we know with kids being at home, distance learning, some of them by parents' own choice, that uh, we have to step up our ways to protect our kids online, and I yield back. Thank you. I really want to thank you for your, uh, your test testimony and your remarks, uh, Mr. Soto. Um, and now, Angie Craig, Congresswoman Craig, it is your five minutes. Take thank it away. You. Thank you so much, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you for holding this incredibly important hearing today. Dr. Amina Dean, I also want to thank you uh, for representing the Mayo Clinic so well in the great state of Minnesota and for helping to keep our kids and our uh, families safe and healthy. Uh, I'm just thrilled that you're on our panel and I get to ask you a few questions. So um, I'd like to start with uh, kids online uh, during COVID and just share that uh, as the mother of four boys, I know it can be a challenge to consistently and diligently enforce limits on screen time for our kids and particularly during a public health crisis when so many of our children, uh, our students have been uh, learning remotely or uh, partially hybrid. Um, this in fact was the case for our youngest son who's a senior in high school uh, this year and I guess our own experience in our family is that it becomes harder as kids uh, get older and they become more independent, which is why I think that trying to instill good habits and stricter limits on younger kids is so important. Um, but parents trying to do the best thing and start these habits early really do face an uneven playing field as they try to compete in a digital ecosystem that, as you know, is replete with features intended to influence user behavior while maximizing product use and engagement. So, uh, Doctor, uh, in terms of the policy recommendations to Congress that you've made in your testimony today, would you consider any of them being particularly critical as you sort of segment it to younger children, those age uh, two to 10, for example? 
Um, well, hello, Representative Craig. I'm thrilled to be uh, reaching you from Southeast Minnesota. Um, thank you for that question. Um, number one, I just want to say, uh, you know, I, I, I hear you. Um, the, the concerns you expressed about children and parents having a hard time is absolutely what I've been hearing from, from pretty much all my patients here today. Um, and so in looking at, you know, how to protect kids, you know, around ages two to 10, what are the most important things? Um, again, I think that we should make sure that there aren't any loopholes in COPA, even though Technically, they're not supposed to target, uh, you know, uh, advertising or gather information on children under 13. There, there are just huge loopholes. So I think the more we can do to tighten up those loopholes to ensure that there is um, appropriate enforcement, um, if there is uh, any sort of um, uh, break breaking of, of those rules, uh, would be would be absolutely critical. Well, thank you so much. You also mentioned uh, in your testimony. Um, the need for more research on the effects of advertising and digital media in children. And I, I certainly uh, could not agree more with that recommendation as well. Um, I have a follow-up question and I want to direct this to um, uh, Ms. Fox Johnson. I appreciate that you've provided us with a number of policy recommendations as well from your perspective at Common Sense. Are there any of these recommendations, again, that you feel would be particularly helpful for parents with younger children uh, who could be thinking about limiting their screen time and what they are exposed to online? Thank you, Representative Craig. Uh, that's a great question. Um, I think the Kids Act would be particularly beneficial for young children. And another thing that would be particularly beneficial for young children would be the Camera Act the Children and Media Research Advancement Act and passing that, it would give funding so we could better study the long-term longitudinal effects of all kinds of technology on kids, including really young kids. As you've heard today, there's discussion about how social media affects teens, which way, and that would be really incredible to have uh, studies funded, you know, not by the industry. Well, I appreciate so much the two of you being here. And um, with that, Madam Chair, I will yield back a minute of everyone's life. Our uh, next, uh, let me call on Ms. Fletcher. You still here? Yes, thank you so thank much. Thank you for waiting. Five minutes for here. questioning. Thank you. I'm here and I uh, really appreciate you organizing today's hearing. Uh, I have appreciated the testimony of our witnesses, uh, both the written testimony that's been submitted and hearing from you all today uh, has been really, really helpful in working through these issues that communities across the country, uh, including mine, are facing throughout this pandemic and more broadly, these concerns about uh, keeping kids online safely, uh, increasing use of digital media, um, and how we how we move forward uh, is really, really important. So um, I have a few questions and I wanna follow up on some of the things some of my colleagues have asked. Um, Ms. Fox Johnson, I wanna start with you. In your testimony, um, you shared that 75% of children between ages of eight and 11 can't distinguish ads from other content. And I think this is, is really important um, to kind of drill down on this. You, you also mentioned that students um, or children who see online ads are significantly more likely to use those products. And you touched on this um, briefly in response to uh, Representative Dingle's questions. Um, one of the things you mentioned is that kind of the, the hashtag ads on sponsored media posts just isn't sufficient. So can you talk a little bit more about what research has been done to indicate changing consumer habits, especially in children, about when an ad is properly identified or when it isn't, um, and, and maybe even more broadly, um, kind of research efforts that you would recommend to be able to, to determine what we can do that will be sufficient. Thank you, Representative Fletcher. So um, research shows that really young kids, four or five, you know, they don't even know that an ad is an ad. And as kids get older, they don't know that an ad's purpose is to sell them something. Um, a lot of these studies were done with traditional media. So now it's even more confusing. Um, with native content on the internet, you might think you're reading a Teen Vogue article and then not realize that Facebook has in fact uh, sponsored it. You might be playing a game and not realize that Coca-Cola has paid for the game. Um, you may be watching an unboxing video and not realize that that's product placement. So um, the research shows that kids don't understand this stuff and the internet has made it 
much more confusing. And also these ads can be more problematic for kids because they're personally targeted to them, designed specifically to appeal to that individual based on what they've done in the past. Um, we need more research, as I mentioned. We need things like the Camera Act. We need research that's funded by NIH and by independent entities, so it's not all the companies knowing what's most effective based on their own research. Um, well, thank you. And um, kind of on a related note, um, I, I agree. I think a lot of this legislation um, is really important for us to be looking at and moving, um, and especially when it comes to, to the research and making sure that we're, we're looking at uh, research at NIH. But, you know, one of the challenges we face in Congress uh, is that it does take a while to respond. And so, yes, you know, technology continues to adapt and change, um, you know, how do we make sure that the tools that are in place um, stay up to date? How do we make sure um, that COPA, for example, uh, is inclusive of new developments and can respond to the quick pace of technology uh, that moves a whole lot faster than Congress and uh, faster than than most other things. You mentioned better resources for the FTC earlier. Uh, what do you think we can and should do? If you uh, give the FTC more funding, they'll be able to hire more technologists, they'll be able to hire more attorneys and other experts. Um, we and others have proposed having a division specifically focused on kids or specifically focused on privacy and technology at the FTC. Um, another really important tool for the FTC that we've seen with COPPA is their rulemaking authority. You know, COPPA was passed over 20 years ago, but happily it was at least updated in 2013 by the FTC. So any future laws should give them the ability to be a little more nimble, even though they're, you know, not as nimble as the tech companies. Um, thank you very much. And um, I just have a few more seconds, but I'd like to um, direct my last question to Dr. Amina Dean. Um, what do you wish had been in place, both in terms of digital infrastructure and safeguards prior to the pandemic in order to help families manage this difficult time? Oh, thank you, Representative Fletcher. Um, essentially, what I wish for is um, what we, we've outlined and, and recommended um, from the American Academy of Pediatrics for, for years, which would be stronger protections, no targeting for kids under 18, um, and really kind of closing those loopholes that, unfortunately, tech companies can exploit. So, yes, ideally, everything that has been on our wish lists for years, but thank you. Well, thank you for that. And uh, it coincides with the end of my five minutes. So Madam Chairwoman, thank you so much. Uh, I yield back. Thank you, the gentlelady yields back. So we um, welcome people who are not on the um, subcommittee to come and ask questions. And in this case, we have two people and I am going to call first on Congressman Wahlberg, five minutes of questioning for you. I thank I thank the uh, gentlelady and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, to join this subcommittee today on a very very important hearing that I think we hear a lot of bipartisanship about as well. So I appreciate that. Uh, families in my, my district uh, tell me day after day that their children are frustrated, they're lonely and sad. Kids who once were good students and athletes are now struggling with depression and anxiety. One parent who wrote me recently described the feeling as simply being trapped, totally trapped. And I've been advocating to safely open schools uh, since last summer. I think it's time, frankly, to do it. It's unacceptable for leaders in charge to be dragging their feet for political purposes at the expense of our children. Again, my, my opinion. Uh, I would, though, like to give Dr. DeAngelis a moment to respond to some of my colleagues' statements regarding his testimony. Uh, Dr. DeAngelis is an expert witness on how our kids are being impacted by constantly being on being online. Uh, he has important evidence from medical and academia professionals. Uh, this is uh, having uh, the impact it's having on them. He deserves to be heard. So, Dr. DeAngelis, would you like to speak briefly, and I please briefly, mm -hmm. about the political dynamics regarding school reopening decisions? Yeah, absolutely. We can't just sit here and cover our ears, acting like the teachers' unions have had nothing to do with the. Uh 
fighting against the reopening of schools for in-person instruction every step of the way in so many places. And every single study that's been done on the topic, and there have been about a handful, and I've done one or two of them, have found that the strongest indicators of reopening in person, all they'll seek well, after throwing in a ton of controls into the models, is political partisanship and strength of the teachers unions in the local area. There's been a Brown University paper on this. There's a forthcoming publication in Social Science Quarterly that's looked at this. Brookings University scholar has also, John Vallant, has also found and uh, using na national data that the COVID risk did not pr uh, predict the reopening of schools, but that the political partisanship in the area. Did we lose him? A am I am I still on? Yes, Mr. Wahlberg, you are still on. But we lost uh, Corey. Well, I th think he, he made some strong points there, and I and I'm not going to suggest that there was any untoward action to cut him off at all. Thank you for uh, that. that. That's the challenge we face with this, you know. So I get it. I get it, uh, Madam Chair. As I mentioned at the beginning of this hearing, uh, I'm proud to introduce and reintroduce the Protect Kids Act with my good friend and colleague, Congressman Rush. The bill represents, I believe, a reasonable common sense and bipartisan agreement that better reflects the realities of today's online world and strengthens children's digital safety. Currently, the Children's, children's Online Privacy Protection Act, or COPPA, imposes requirements on website operators that specifically deal with information, personal information of, of children 13 years of age and younger. I'd like to uh, turn to uh, 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 Ms. Fox Johnson. And thank you for being here. I understand um, that um, my time is limited. So if you could answer me just a yes or no, and I hate that uh, that request, but I, I have to ask you this time. Uh, do you agree that the COPPA law has by and large succeeded in Congress's intent to protect children's digital footprint and remains to a great degree relevant today? Yes or no? No. Thank you. Uh, I understand you've also authored a piece called 13 Going On 30. One of your conclusions is to extend COPPA beyond 13 years of age to include adults as well. Is it fair to say that you would support a strong national standard without a private right of action as COPPA has succeeded in doing? Again, be brief if you can. I can't speak to whether the private right of action without knowing what's what's in the bill, but one of COPPA's shortcomings is that it doesn't cover anyone over 13, and sites can pretend like it doesn't apply to them, and so if it applied to everyone, they could no longer pretend that. Well, thank you. I, I, Madam Chair, I'd I just like to point out that while there are much needed reforms, COPPA has been a fairly effective law for 23 years uh, without any pride of re uh, private right of action. Uh, it, needs to be, it needs to be amended. It needs to be updated. I agree. But I certainly would ask my Democratic colleagues uh, to work in a bipartisan manner, as Congressman Rush and I have done, to modernize this law, reforming the law with a provision uh, aimed at helping trial lawyers certainly does not help kids. And with that, I appreciate being involved, and uh, I yield back. Gentleman um, yields back, and um, now uh, I call on Last but certainly not least, Congresswoman Blunt Rochester. Thank you so much, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you for this important hearing, to Ms. Kaptur for your leadership on updating COPPA, and to the witnesses for attending this hearing and also for your patience uh, waiting for me to go last. Um, when I chose to lead the House version of Senator Warren's Detour Act, it was because I was worried that everyone, especially children, um, would increasingly be exploited by manipulative digital practices known as dark patterns. Uh, sadly, um, the testimony today confirms these concerns and these fears. And, and as a few of our witnesses testified, these trends are worse for lower wealth households as children in them may spend significantly more time with screens than those of households with greater wealth. Worse still, this gap grows when considering race and ethnicity. And as many have noted, um, we all 
should have serious concerns for ethical and public health reasons. Uh, we may soon have a tech pessimistic generation that only sees the exploitive potential for the innovative technologies of the future. And so my question, I'll start with uh, you, Ms. Fox Johnson, and it really follows up on uh, the previous question that, that we just heard, some of the line of questioning. I believe Congress needs to act and address dark patterns, uh, such as design choices that are intended to manipulate individuals into using products or services without their consent or for little personal gain, especially when applied to children. And we often see tech design subverting parental choice. But you mentioned a troubling, uh, though natural, parent-child relationship as uh, children grow older. Their parents naturally supervise their behaviors less. So my first question is, for older kids and teens, do you believe that the, super, uh, the subversion of their choice is a unique problem and why? Thank you for that question, Representative Rochester. So we think that children and teens need to be recognized for their evolving capacities. So you shouldn't treat a teenager exactly the same way that you would treat a young child. Teens still need special protections and safeguards, and we could think of them like training wheels or like your temporary driver's permit, right? They still need help, but they should be empowered in learning how to make more choices for themselves. Um, the UK Age Appropriate Design is an, Code is an excellent example of this. It breaks kids into five different age groups and talk, talks about meeting kids and teens where they are and doing things appropriate to their mental capacities. Excellent. And do we need more research to better understand how dark patterns affect teens? 100%. We need more research to understand how dark patterns affect teens, affect kids, affect adults. And that's one thing, especially with kids and teens, that the Camera Act would support. Do we know anything about how tech companies today are designing their products in relation to teens, such as making specific design choices or products that are targeted to this age group? Yes, I mean, teens are like the canary in the coal mine and they're also a very attractive commercial target for these tech companies. And they're designing their products to keep to hook kids early and to keep them for life. I think my, my last question kind of goes to the issue of transparency with many of these tech companies. Um, as you and um, my colleagues have identified, often personal information of minors is mined by these apps for commercial purposes, but it seems to go deeper than this in ways that we don't know. And a few years ago, Facebook gained infamy for conducting psychological experiments and behavioral studies on its users without their consent. Did these experiments and studies um, pull in children and do we know if these studies have stopped or is the lack of transparency continue to be a, a significant problem? Uh, these studies have definitely involved teenagers and they've probably involved, for all we know, everyone on um, Facebook and social media companies' sites. One of the biggest problems with these studies is we just find out about them because there will be a leaked news report or a rogue employee. There's so much data that these companies have. You know, a researcher would have to get consents and go through processes. These, these companies can largely do whatever they want with all of the massive stores of data they have and conduct behavioral research on all of us without our knowledge. Thank you so much for answering that question. Um, I, I will just say that I think one of my colleagues mentioned that there are opportunities for bipartisanship here. This is a vital area. I'm so glad that Ms. Kaptur is again taking up the mantle on this. Thank you so much, Madam Chairwoman, for your leadership as we look at these issues that affect everyone, but particularly affect our children. Uh, thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. I thank you. Um, and now I would like to give a special hearty thank you to our witnesses for their participation in today's uh, hearing. Before we conclude, I request unanimous consent uh, to enter the following documents into the, the record. Um, and there's quite a, there's quite a list. Um, a written statement from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, a letter from, the, from uh, Prevent Blindness, an article from Vox, an article from the Chicago Sun-Times, an article from the Globe um, and, and Mail, Inc., a, an article from um, NPR, an article from All About Ann, Oh, all about all about Ann Arbor. Um, an article from the uh, World Health Organization. An article from the New York Times. An op-ed 
in the Chicago Tribune, an op-ed in the Los, Angel, Los Angeles Times, um, an article from the Wall Street Journal, an article from USA Today, an article from the Arizona Daily Star. Um, I, if there are no objections, and I hear none, so ordered. Um, I remind members that pursuant to committee rules, they have 10 days to submit additional questions for the record um, to be answered by the witnesses who have appeared. Um, I ask each witness um, to respond promptly to any questions, and I know there were some because people were running out of time, um, that you may receive. And at this time, with a lot of gratitude for the participation by the members and by the witnesses, the subcommittee is adjourned.